Hello, son, and daughter. This Sunday, old Tex will take you on a wild ride through them deep woods, national parks, and encountering the legendary critter himself, old Bigfoot, so grab your flashlight, hold on to your britches, and get ready for some bone-chilling stories. Let's go, son! Hello, everyone. I want to remain anonymous because many people won't believe what I saw in Yellowstone National Park. I'm a seasoned park ranger, and this happened as the autumn season approached, and the reports of unsettling encounters within the park grew, so seed of doubt began to take root in my mind. Basically, hikers and campers gave me various reports about they saw, a weird figure-looking creature in park. I dismissed these reports as exaggerated tales or mere figments of people's imaginations. After all, I had patrolled these trails for years and had never come across anything out of the ordinary. So one crisp morning, while on a routine patrol of a lesser-known trail, a peculiar sound cut through the tranquil air. It was a screech that seemed to defy any logical explanation. My curiosity peaked. I followed the direction of the sound. As I ventured deeper into the woods, the surroundings became shrouded in an eerie silence. The tall trees stood like sentinels, their branches reaching towards the sky, seemingly hiding secrets within their rustling leaves. Suddenly a cold shiver ran down my spine, and I felt a gaze fixated upon me. Turning around slowly, I saw it, a figure standing in the shadows, taller than any human, with a dark, indistinct form. Its eyes, illuminated by my flashlight, glowed an unnatural shade of red. Tam stood still as the figure locked eyes with me, a sense of imminent danger emanating from its presence. Fear gripped me, paralyzing my muscles. I couldn't tear my gaze away as the figure turned its head and began to walk towards a deep gully, disappearing into the depths of the park. It was the same figure that had been described in the earlier reports the elusive creature that had haunted the thoughts of hikers and campers. Reality blurred as I grappled with the unimaginable truth before me. What I had once dismissed as folklore had become a chilling reality standing right in front of me. The doubts that had clouded my mind evaporated, replaced by a bone-chilling certainty. This was no tall story. This was an encounter with an enigma that defied explanation. Slowly regaining control of my trembling body, I reached for my radio, my voice betraying the fear that consumed me. I relayed the events to my fellow rangers, my words trembling with an urgency born from the realization that our park was harboring something beyond our comprehension. In the days and weeks that followed, our team embarked on a relentless pursuit to catch the creature and see what it is, but no one ever saw it again. Neither I, who to this day curse myself for not running towards it to see where he go. My brother and I found a mid-90s SUV in the woods elk hunting last year. It wasn't in a spot I'd camp. It was more or less hidden and parked right in the trees. Walked by it two days, figuring the owner was out hunting at the time third day there was snow and no tracks coming or going so we checked it out figured 100 percent there'd be a body in there no body just a bunch of belongings and trash called it into the county sheriff's office but never heard what came of it would have been a five mile hike to town so kind of weird i've also had that being watched feeling Hiking into my stand, stopped and turned on my headlamp and had narrow set eyes shine back from about 20 feet off the trail. I think it was a coyote, but it left quietly and quickly after I turned the light on. Never got a good look at it. Early autumn 1996, and I had just returned from a tour of the Falklands Islands with the RAF. Through a sequence of events involving my trade being civilianized by the United Kingdom Ministry of Defense, I knew in advance that I was being discharged almost as soon as we got back to the United Kingdom, despite only serving two years. I still lived with my parents, male 20, but they had left the day before on holiday. 
important later. I got unpacked, made a couple of calls, and head straight out to see friends for the evening. We go to a quiz night, and all the teams end up swapping papers for marking purposes, school style, except us. Somehow, we've still got our own answers. We proceed to improve our answers as the quiz master goes through them, and surprise, surprise, we win. The prize is a bottle of white wine. Also important later, none of us touch the stuff, and I'm driving anyway, but the whole silly, cheating nonsense was funny. End of the night, I drive home and remember the security alarm was still set the way the previous owners had it. You had to go around the back to enter and get the 45-second window to turn off the alarm. Front door would just wake up the neighbors with alarm noise. I head around the back and am fiddling for my door key in the dark garden when I realize something is up. There's no reflection in the window. It takes me a second to realize there is no window. Not smashed, just not there. I spin round expecting someone behind me in the dark, but I'm alone. I become acutely aware of the winnings from the quiz night. A nice heavy weight in my hand and I turn it over in my hand to use it like a club. I spot the window laying in the grass. It's a standard white UPVC double glazing pane in its frame, so the whole piece that moves when you open the window has been removed, no less no damage. The careful placing of the window on the wet grass also means no fingerprints, so I'm not reassured by the apparently professional approach. I turn back to the door and consider my next move. The door opens into the utility room, then the kitchen. The alarm panel is in the cupboard at the far end of the kitchen. Simple enough, except entering through the window would not have triggered the alarm. On the other hand, leaving the kitchen to enter hallway would trip the PIR sensor, so the intruder, having entered via the window, must be in the kitchen. Where the knives are, I psyche myself up, unlock the door, and move quickly inside fully, expecting a fight. No one. The alarm is beeping. It's count down quietly because I broke the contact when I entered. I head over and switch it off, but I'm still wired, and decide I need to be sure that I'm alone in the house. I proceed to enter every room, switching on lights as I go, ready to club someone with a cheap bottle of Chardonnay. I get to the last room, my parents' bedroom. I open it light on, and the entire house goes dark. I am so psyched up for a fight, and all my movie geek brain could think was. Ripley, they cut the power, Private Hudson. What do you mean they cut the power? How could they cut the power, man? They're animals. The landline phone still worked just from the tiny voltage on the phone line, and a handset was in the bedroom, so I called the police. I wait right where I am. Fifteen minutes goes by, and they arrive. My dad was such a bloody skin flint that he'd never had all the lights on at once, and I'd tripped the fuse. It turned out that my dad had the driveway repaved, and it was taking longer than agreed. He made the fatal mistake of saying, I need you to finish. We're going away tomorrow. It was never proven, but I think the traveler types that did the work saw an opportunity. They apparently removed the window and saw that I had left the spare key right there on the window sill. A blessing in disguise because they unlocked the door, set off the alarm, and the neighbor had called my uncle. He came round. Woe found no one there and resecured the house without noticing the missing window. Our one-year wedding anniversary was April 17, 2000. Bob rented a car because the Jeep was in the shop. After dinner, he surprised me by taking me up to our favorite big-footing spot. We took the Gowdyville Road. It was nearing dusk, and we approached the freshly logged area where we had found possible tracks a couple of weeks before. Bob suddenly stops the car and points to the embankment on the right. We stop a lot along our drives in the woods in order to check impressions. They rarely amount to anything, but this night we hit the jackpot. We had no camera with us since the drive was a surprise, so we went back two nights later and took photos. There were six impressions in all, covering a distance of about 20 feet going up an embankment. The stride, as measured from heel to toe, was three and a half feet uphill, and Bob can barely match it. 
The prints were 14 feet long and about 5 feet wide. There were no toe details. The Gaudyville area has a history of sighting and footprint reports. A friend who works in the local grocery store told us that he and a friend were hunting up there a few years ago and found tracks. Another friend claims that his mom kept horses just off of the Cottage Grove, Lorraine Road, and that she heard screams coming from the Gaudyville area, which spooked her horses. Me and my girlfriend, now wife, did a road trip out to Haida Gwaii back in 2017. We walked on the ferry and rented an older Ford truck on the island. The whole island kind of gave me an eerie feeling, just being in this weird, overgrown rainforest environment that I was not used to. Lots of people seemingly squatting on crown land everywhere as well. Anyway, after a day of crabbing, we jumped in the truck and were looking for somewhere to set up a camp. We had been just setting up down old logging roads. We took a turn off the highway onto one and kept following it, thinking we might get a good spot with a view. The trail kept getting narrower and narrower the farther we went. Way to hell back in there. We hit a small clearing with a very narrow trail exiting the back. It seemed like a good spot, and the trail looked like it would lead to a river. There were no tracks into the clearing, so it seemed we would have some privacy. We got out of the truck, and it was just impenetrable regrowth on every side of the clearing, and I was getting that hair standing up on the back of my neck feeling. Kind of a hills have eyes feeling. The sun was going down, and the thick brush accelerated it. We decided to check out the narrow trail down to the river, but I get maybe five steps down the trail and glance down and sitting in the middle of the trail, on top of the grass and soft soil, is a single kid's cat's eye, marble. It looked like it could have been dropped moments earlier. Freaked me out for some reason and we got out of there. When I was around five years old, I was asleep in the living room, along with my siblings and parents, as we didn't have bedrooms at the time. Across the living room was the kitchen. I wake up around 2, 3 a.m., look to a huge wooden spoon hanging by the window. The usual. However, there was a large, bright, white, glowing light reflecting, and I got confused. So I went into the kitchen, turned my head to the left directly in front of the stairs, and there an apparition was, a girl with huge black stringy eyes, black crazy frizzy hair, and no nose or mouth. She was wearing a white gown. All of her was white. It matched her gown, and it all flowed into the floor. I asked what she wanted, and nothing happened. I stared in awe for a couple seconds, ran back to the living room, tried waking everyone up to no avail. The reflection could still be seen. I covered myself fully with a blanket and cried myself to sleep. I would tell my mother about it immediately, and a few weeks ago, when we were discussing this event, she told me that I spoke to her about being afraid of this girl in the house. But she would comfort me by saying I was okay and safe and that nobody was there. She would eventually see the girl for herself and connect it to what I told her, and she would go upstairs to make sure I was okay. My brother also saw her. But when he saw her, she was sitting on his bed with a polka dot dress, still black eyes and black crazy hair. A few years later, I would see her again. My brothers were jumping on the trampoline with their friend and went inside after I went to join them. I was jumping by myself and looked up at the window above the stairs. And she was looking outside. She looked the same, black stringy eyes. It was like 10 a.m. and everybody was home. But I was the only one to see it. That was the last time I ever saw her, thankfully. She was the scariest thing I have ever seen with my own eyes. A lot of paranormal happened in that house, however. This story is one of the worst ones. My dad used to have audio of a little girl within the home. When he left for work, and before I was even born, I'm the only girl, besides my mom. He didn't even mean to capture anything, besides a haunted painting, which a camera was pointed at the entire time. The video was around six, eight hours in length, and the girl didn't start talking until around 2.5 hours in. You could hear jumping on the bed. 
That would be my parents' bed, little feet running down the hallway, and a little girl saying, Daddy, I made it through. Then you heard a low grunt sound right after. I'm not going to lie that painting is extremely haunted. You could see it change expression slightly, but noticeably, and feel wetness under the eyes when it looked upset. It's very possible that it opened up some sort of portal. Whenever that painting is hung up, be prepared for the paranormal and strange, is all I'm saying. I don't know what happened to that painting for it to become haunted, but it's not a good haunting, that's for sure. My dad claims he got rid of it, but it's a painting of his grandma. I don't have much to believe that he got rid of it. I was headed out early this past Saturday to enjoy the CO Turkey opener, planned on making a weekend out of it, and was going to backpack in north of the Powder River. As I was making my way down the winding road along the river, I saw a woman waving her arms frantically running down the side of the road. To preface, there was an absolute lack of cell service, total dead spot, and it was pitch black, 4.15 a.m., as I pull up alongside the woman and roll down my window, I can see the blood on her face and what looked like a broken nose. She starts screaming that her boyfriend is trying to kill her and she needs help getting away now. I make a panic snap judgment and let her in the truck. As we pull off and I look for a spot to turn around and head back into town, she starts screaming again and points at a car sitting on the side of the road. That's my boyfriend. You have to get me away from him. So I rip a U-turn and speed back into town. He follows me for a mile or so, not like aggressively just following behind. I reach a light that is red and just run that F. He stays behind at the light. She tells me that I can take her back to the hotel she was staying at, but I ask if her boyfriend knew that she was staying there, which she said yes, so obviously I can't take her there. I ask if she has any family in the area, and it turns out her grandparents were about an hour away, which was no problem given the situation. The next hour, as we drive, she details three years of absolute horror with this guy. Now I am 25 and have no children, but was bringing me to tears hearing what was done to her. At the end, we get to her grandparents' house, and her brother came out, shook hands, and told him what I saw. Seemed that he was ready to murder the guy. Felt comfortable leaving her and went on my way. Never know what you will run into away from the city before dawn. It was dead of winter at my grandparents' home before I was born. My grandma and uncles were home. This man knocks on the door. Black hat, trench coat, black medium, length, stringy hair, super pale, dead-looking eyes. My grandma opens the door and wasn't the type of person to turn anyone away based on appearance. He didn't speak, however, so she went to go grab some paper and a pen for him to write on. My uncle went to the door, looked at him, and simply said, I'm not afraid of you. The man turned around, walked out of the door, and left no trace whatsoever. He instantly vanished. No footsteps or anything. No car was around. He simply was gone. When I was little... At my parents' house, I would see this man in reflection sometimes. One time my brother saw a man looking like that, standing inside and looking out of my bedroom window on the second story and nobody was home. This man wasn't a shadow. He resembled a human being, however, was far from it. Some speculate he is a demon. I'm a United States soldier. This was a day like any other as we traveled through the dense forest in our convoy descending a nearby logging road. We had heard rumors about strange creatures in the area, but none of us had ever seen any evidence ourselves, so we didn't think much of it. As we approached a quarry, I suddenly caught sight of something extraordinary. Three massive bipedal hominids covered in black or very dark brown hair from head to foot were standing near the edge of the clearing. The middle creature was the tallest, about seven to eight feet tall, and it was flanked by two slightly shorter ones, standing around six to seven feet tall. I couldn't believe my eyes. The tallest creature stood very still, 
while the other two seemed to rock side to side, shifting their weight from one foot to the other. They appeared to be observing our convoy with great interest. I wasn't the only one who saw these creatures. Sergeant Jeff Martin, another member of our convoy, had actually witnessed the same three beings about 30 minutes earlier. He had observed them leaving the quarry, and they had moved with a graceful, fluid, glide-like stride, accompanied by exaggerated arm swings. Sergeant Martin noted how they seemed to cover an impressive amount of distance with just a few steps. We were all astonished by our encounter with these elusive creatures. It was clear that they were intelligent and curious, and they seemed to have a keen interest in our movements. We couldn't help but wonder what they were thinking as they watched us from a distance. As we continued our journey, the sighting left a lasting impression on all of us. We couldn't shake the feeling that we had just witnessed something truly extraordinary, a glimpse into a world that few people ever get the chance to see. It was February 6th. 1993, and I decided to head back to the same area where I'd encountered something strange before. This time, I was accompanied by Jennifer, Chris, Don, and my girlfriend. We were all curious to see if we could find any evidence of the mysterious creature with amber glowing eyes I had seen previously. We found ourselves near a dump just east of the Bergsvik Creek Fish Hatchery, it was said that maybe Bigfoot scooped fish from the hatcheries, which piqued our curiosity even more. The day before, there had been a massive storm with winds reaching up to 80 miles per hour. As a result, we had to drive slowly due to the broken limbs scattered across the road. As dusk approached, we were about 150 yards from the dump when the mysterious creature appeared again. It walked behind our car and I could see it clearly through the backup lights. The amber glowing eyes were unmistakable. It looked like the same creature I had seen before, as I recognized the gray colors on its body. The next day, we decided to return to the scene with a police officer and his German shepherd dog, hoping to find some evidence of the creature's presence. However, as soon as we arrived, the dog refused to get out of the truck. There was a strong dead smell in the air that seemed to frighten the dog. Though our encounter was brief, it left us all with a sense of wonder and excitement. We couldn't help but think about the possibility of a mysterious creature like Bigfoot roaming the woods in our area. Our experience served as a reminder that there are still many unknowns in this world, and sometimes the most unexpected moments can turn into unforgettable adventures. It was May 18, 1993, when I, Mark Port, stumbled upon mysterious tracks once again near the Green Peter Dam, close to Lebanon, Oregon. The tracks measured approximately 14 by 5 inches, and I couldn't help but feel a sense of excitement and curiosity as I examined them. I recalled a similar experience I had while hunting near John Day, Oregon, back in 1990 and 1993. I remembered being deep in the woods, surrounded by the sounds of nature, when I suddenly heard something unusual. It was a strange noise, like the rubbing of sticks back and forth. The peculiar thing was that it sounded like several individuals were doing it. The noise was persistent and eerie, sending a chill down my spine. As I stood by the Green Peter Dam, reflecting on those past experiences, I couldn't shake the feeling that there was something out there. Something that had left those tracks and made those mysterious sounds. I felt a mixture of intrigue and fear, wondering what kind of creature could be responsible for the traces I had discovered. Determined to learn more, I decided to investigate further. I ventured deeper into the woods, following the trail of tracks as best as I could. The forest was dense, and the deeper I went, the more mysterious it felt. The sounds of the woods seemed to grow quieter as I approached the source of the tracks. Then, as I stepped over a fallen log, I heard it again, the sound of sticks rubbing together. My heart raced as I realized that whatever had made those tracks and those sounds was nearby. I cautiously moved forward, scanning the trees and underbrush for any sign of movement. 
As the sound grew louder, I knew I was getting closer to the source. I held my breath, hoping to catch a glimpse of the creature responsible for the tracks and noises. But just as I was about to lay eyes on it, the sound abruptly stopped and the forest fell silent. Frustrated and unnerved, I decided it was time to head back. I had come close to discovering the truth, but it seemed the mysterious creature wanted to remain hidden. I don't think they were human. This was an experience that happened when I was a kid, probably 10 years old in 2010. I'm 22, now for reference. There used to be this park my dad would take me to here in Maryland. He would play basketball in the section where the courts were, and I would play in the section with the park equipment. One day I was on a swing set, and this couple came up and started talking to me. There was a man and a woman with a black stroller. I, I don't think I ever saw a baby in the stroller. I remember it always being faced away from me. This may have been a normal interaction, but something felt very off or dream like about the encounter. Say, so I, I was even able to pick up on it at that age. The man in the couple was wearing blue jeans and a red and white plaid checkered shirt, but he looked odd, like kind of clammy pale or jaundiced gray. I also remember his eyes being very penetrating. The woman had on a dress, and I think, had medium length brown hair. I can't remember her face, no matter how hard I try, though. She looked more normal from what I remember. The best way to describe the man's hair would be kind of blonde, ashen and artificial, looking, in a sort of bowl, cut style, I think. I can't remember exactly what we talked about, but I think it revolved around God religion, and it was a fairly short interaction, probably about ten minutes. The weirder part is that I saw them later at a completely different park on a different date, could have been weeks or months, and they were in the exact same outfits with the exact same stroller. It looked like only five minutes had passed, but it was a completely different location at a different time. I can remember feeling apprehensive and off when I saw them again. Strangely, I can't remember if I talked to them or not a second time. The last key to the story is that when I told my dad about seeing this couple multiple times as a kid, he said that maybe they were angels. I remember that comment intensely freaking me out for some reason. Now, there could be a perfectly rational explanation for this, but more recently I've been doing more spiritual work and growth as well as scientific, astrophysical, biological, quantum physics theory, extra, etc. Research and this memory resurfacing prompted me to share it. It's not the first time I recall this happening. But it is the first time I feel like I could maybe get some explanation. I'd be happy to provide any more context about my life if it's helpful or the encounters. If I can remember, it wasn't the sort of thing where they did anything really suspect I could tell my dad or police about. The man just didn't look human. Like the only way to describe it was he looked like a wilted flower, an uncanny, clammy, human wilted flower. That's the weird part. I do remember sort of shuffling off toward the courts after talking to them. But the second time, I can't remember if I approached them or not, which is strange. It's fuzzy. It sort of blips in and out. Both encounters felt sort of dream-like. I also usually have a good brain for remembering faces. But I can't really remember the lady's face, a good portion of the guys in detail could certainly be chalked up to the fact that this was a while ago, but I still recognize people around my hometown from when I was that age, so I don't know. I just felt scared or off, like not quite right. Even now, it's the sort of thing where if I hadn't externally told my dad, he didn't also physically notice them. I would doubt that it actually happened. I just remember feeling that was weird. It gave me a sort of a weird feeling especially the second time I saw them. I live on a compound by myself. I know it sounds waka, but it's really my tiny home, workshop, and a couple of other buildings for food or equipment storage, and a guest room. 
One bad snowstorm knocked my area O-OK, so I decided to hunker in for the long haul. I spent almost two weeks without leaving. Three days in, I get woken up to a knock at the door. I get up to answer it, and halfway there, I realize the only way this guy could knock on my door is if he broke the lock. So I grab my shotgun and ask him through the door who he is and what he wants. Guy says nothing and keeps banging. I go out the back door and sneak around front and I see a man who is on the ground covered in blood and shouting, albeit quietly, for help. Turns out he was driving and crashed and dragged himself five miles down the road until he came to my place. By then he realized that I forgot to lock the bottom part of the gate and weaseled in. Luckily he survived. My grandfather was a fisherman with a bad habit of finding dead bodies. I haven't thought about this in a while, but just googled it and found this description of one of his encounters on Saturday, July 11, 1970, the Park County Sheriff's Office received a call from a fisherman near Gardner. He just pulled up the scariest snag of his life, a waterlogged human torso. By Monday, that mutilated torso was on a table in the Park County Sheriff's Office, being examined by the FBI. The head and arms had been cut off. The legs were gone below the knee. On the chest, amid stab wounds, there was a T-shaped cut where the killer had opened his body to get to his innards. Two things were clear. The victim was without a heart, and his murderer was heartless. Turns out it was cannibalism. A friend of mine has been a fisherman for a long time. Once he was off the Grand Banks late at night, piloting a 50-feet trawler, while the rest of the crew slept, he was alone in the crow's nest upper wheelhouse, nursing a bowl of weed when he caught a glimpse of what he said was a large black metal object several dozen yards off his starboard bow. He shot a glance just soon enough to see something large disappear beneath the waves, but he didn't know precisely how large or how far it was due to poor visibility. He looked at his radar and sonar, but saw nothing. Moments later, a massive column of winged black steel burst forth from the sea, roughly fifty yards off his port. He said he soon realized he was looking at the tower of a Trident nuclear submarine. He attempted to hail the sub several times to no avail. After a few minutes, it slipped beneath the surface and vanished without leaving a trace on his radar or sonar. This happened a while ago, but at the time, I really didn't know what it was. I was about 14 years old. My mom had a cleaning business at the time. We cleaned many ranger stations in the local area, but Ripplebrook was one of our longest lasting accounts that needed to be cleaned twice a week, most of the time being after 5 p.m., after work hours. So I spent a lot of time up there as a young kid. My job was emptying out the trash cans and taking the trash from the buildings to the dumpsters, one of the dumpsters being towards the back of the complex next to the pond. This is where I heard the screech. It sounded like a woman screaming, but more animalistic sounding, and it was close. It scared the hell out of me, even more so when I realized there could not be anyone else up there. I ran like hell back to one of the buildings where my father was. I started telling him what I had just heard. He was an avid hunter, so I figured he would know what it was after telling him. He really didn't have a clue. We just dismissed it as a mountain lion. I never thought a mountain lion could sound like that. Anyways, I've heard of many sightings around that area as a kid. I never again have heard anything like that sound that night but working there at the ranger station. There were a lot of stories that we heard of people seeing a nine-foot-tall grizzly bear at O'Lally Lake standing up eating out of the dumpster at nighttime. There are no grizzlies in Oregon, claimed the forest ranger. I spent an entire year in my cousin's finca in Columbia. It's very deep into the mountains, and 90% of his land is covered in forest. That whole year was basically one massive note. 
I can say that at least every other day something completely crazy would happen. One of the things I remember the most was La Ronda. One day I was picking some tomatoes when suddenly the whole mountain goes silent. Not a single animal made a sound. Note that this is Colombia and there are many birds there. Anyway, I stop what I'm doing and listen closely because what the effects when every crater imaginable starts coming out of every hole and every crack and starts hauling ass uphill. Massive tarantulas, huge cockroaches, beetles, mice, rats, etc. Anything that crawled on land, basically. Then the dog started barking and whimpering. That's when my cousin yelled, La Ronda, La Ronda, which basically means the round, the round. He tells me to get inside the house. He gets this bag out with some sort of poison and starts pouring it outside the house. I then hear what sounds like running water coming uphill from the trees. I looked outside and saw what was probably millions of ants crawling up the mountain and eating every living thing in their path. It was absolutely terrifying. I couldn't see the ground because they were so many ants. Luckily, the poison worked and they crawled around the house. My cousin was happy, however, because the ants killed whatever pests were around. It was on a hot summer night that I was out in the dark woods with my neighbor, whom I'm pretty close with. He was like extended family, honestly. The fact that I didn't even know we were going until that night, when I was sitting at home in front of my laptop playing video games. My neighbor came over to see me, and he asked me if I wanted to go camping with him and his family. It had been a while since we last did anything together, so of course I said yes. It would have just given us an excuse not to go to school for a couple of days. This was in September. So school had just started back up, and the coldness of fall had not yet come, so it was perfect. The next day, his family and I gathered our camping gear. We're driving down a dark road with tall trees on the other side of it. It was getting dark quickly, so we had to turn the lights on, and unfortunately, which means we would have had to set up in the dark. So we're driving for about an hour or two, but it felt like it took forever. My friend's dad turned left at an unmarked intersection where there wasn't even a sign saying that this was the right turn off the road. The road got bumpy and rocky as he drove over this very raw, unpaved road. That's when we came across a large clearing because all I could see around was trees and darkness. We stopped at this makeshift campground. I say that because there was no clear indicated spot to set up a tent, a spigot, a bathroom or anything. This was truly camping just down the middle of nowhere. Perfect. Now I need to say that it was pitch blackout, and it had gotten really cold now that the sun had set. We were also higher up in elevation, so we got everything set up quickly and decided we would huddle up in the tent together that my friend's father had set up for us. But I just had this feeling lingering within me that we weren't alone. Now my brain was playing tricks on me, so I decided to step out and get some fresh air. It was eerily quiet until I heard this screaming noise. My heart began pounding fast as if it knew what was coming. Then we heard a rustling noise in the bushes, more screaming from the woods. I was so scared that my friend told me to come back into the tent now. Not only could we all hear the noises, but then as I got back in the tent and we shined our light, we could see something moving outside the tent. This shape, my friend's dad got a flashlight shining it too at this object. That's when this thing began screaming and thrashing. Now we're all yelling, freaking out, because we can see the shape of this thing more. It looked like an animal, but all we could see was this large shape, and it was terrifying looking from the silhouette. It looked like an upright, deformed reindeer or something, and it had long claws. It was where we'd been pranked. I wasn't even sure. It screamed again in our direction, and we just prayed for it to leave. It walked her in her tent, and we all kept her flashlight shining at it through the tent material, only revealing its silhouette. But one thing I noticed is it never came closer to the tent. It's like it was pissed that we set up camp here in its area. I get it. 
This probably sounds like some sort of amateur creepy pasta, but tell it to my family, my friend's family, and me who have to deal with the memory of this thing. We stopped hearing it almost literally after we all pretty much urinated all over our sleeping bags out of terror. Surprisingly, none of us had any weapons on us. Somehow we all forgot. We got lucky that night, but who knows what would have happened if it were to come back and possibly check out our tent. Now, of course, my friend's dad regrets that he didn't bring any weapons. He forgot. He normally always carries a pistol. I went home the next day, and we didn't get any sleep that night. What was designed to be a civil day trip turned into a quick overnight terror. I've not been able to go camping since. I don't think I ever will, you know. And I'm also not sure what this thing was or where it came out of. I haven't really sat down to train research either. I don't really care. I just want to get rid of this memory. Something unsettling occurred the other night, leaving me both perplexed and disturbed. It was an incident involving my cherished chickens, and the aftermath defied all logical explanations. In recent weeks, there had been reports of raccoons and foxes roaming the area, making their presence known. However, no other creatures were known to inhabit this vicinity, making this particular occurrence all the more perplexing. As the evening shadows deepened, a sense of unease compelled me to investigate my chicken coop. I braced myself for a sight that would shake me to my core. What I discovered was beyond my worst fears. The once sturdy fence, which had always stood strong, was now bent in half as if some tremendous force had mercilessly twisted it. And that was just the beginning. Upon closer inspection, I realized that the top of another fence, a wire mesh ceiling, had been torn apart with an alarming precision. It was as if no ordinary animal could accomplish such a feat. This was a large gap far too extensive for mere claws or paws to create. The sheer enormity of the destruction left me with a sinking feeling in the pit of my stomach. It was as if something malevolent and supernaturally powerful had paid a visit to my beloved chickens. With trepidation, I began examining the lifeless bodies of my feathered companions, searching for any clues that might shed light on what had transpired. Yet, to my astonishment, there were no telltale signs of an animal attack. No traces of blood, no discernible teeth marks, no visible scratch wounds. It was as if their lives had been taken with a chilling efficiency leaving no visible evidence of the culprit. Adding to the eerie nature of the ordeal, there were no footprints or any other tangible traces of the intruder. It was as if this vampiric entity had come and gone in complete silence, leaving behind only a trail of bewilderment and fear. Throughout that restless night, I pondered the enigma that had unfolded before me. How could such an event occur without any tangible explanation? Why were my chickens targeted with such precision and inexplicable absence of bloodshed? I sought solace in the presence of my faithful canine companion, hoping to find reassurance or some indication that he too had sensed the malevolence that had beset our homestead. Yet even my dog, known for his keen senses, had remained oblivious to the presence of any intruder. It was as if the nocturnal visitor had managed to evade all detection leaving us in a state of confounding perplexity. Days have passed since that harrowing night, but the questions persist. The memory of the inexplicable events lingers, casting a shadow of unease over my once peaceful abode. I am left with a deepening sense of vulnerability, knowing that there are forces at work beyond our comprehension. In this world, mysteries abound, and sometimes the most unsettling occurrences defy all attempts at rational explanation. The encounter with this unknown entity has left me confuzzled, struggling to reconcile the reality of what transpired with the limits of my understanding. Perhaps in time the answers will reveal themselves, shedding light on the inexplicable and quelling the lingering unease that permeates my soul.
So I'm not one for believing too much of cryptid lore. Never had an encounter before or, or anything like that, but my partner and I live on the border of upstate New York, not far from the Whitehall Bigfoot area. One night, partner was taking out the garbage and came back inside startled. I mean, really shook up. They said they had seen a creature that looked like maybe a fox or coyote, but that it then stood up on its hind legs, and so they booked it back inside. Fast forward about a month, and I'm outside on my porch smoking a cigarette, enjoying the stars under a crystal clear sky. We have a small plot next to our house that has a toll behind landscaping trailer permanently parked on it about twenty-ish feet away from the house. After a while of standing outside, I get the sudden and intense feeling like something is watching me, just that primal feeling of danger. It should be noted that, like most people up here, I'm usually carrying a gun on me. Coyotes and bears are fairly common up here, so I kind of do the four corners check of my surroundings. When I looked over to that trailer, I saw there was something the size of a large dog laying in the grass. Mind you, it's a clear night with a not-quite-full moon, and the grass was uncut long, but not like a meadow, if I had to estimate, I'd say seven, nine inches high, so I had a really good view of this thing. Now I know never to approach a random animal bedded down at night, so I just kind of watch it for a second. Even the light of the moon, its outline and coat were pitch black, blacker than anything I've seen before. Unnaturally contrasting against the ground, it laid on. Then it looks up. It has piercing red eyes. I'm thinking, oh, what the F? And put my hand on my revolver. I ain't about to be coyote food. And then it stood up. It stood up on its hind legs. The only way I can describe the legs of it is like that goat or human hybrid from the Narnia movie, but with the torso like a hybrid of man and canine. It was taller than me, and I'm six feet one, didn't even need to take a step. I flicked whatever was left of my cigarette and backed away to the door, locked and bolted it, and spent the rest of the night wondering what I just saw. Now I'll admit, I'm a religious man, but that thing didn't fit the description of any gin I've heard of. It's to this day one of the few things in my life I cannot explain. We've installed security cameras since, but now the lot is under construction, and we haven't seen it since. I don't know what I saw that night, truly, but I intend to find out one way or another. I want to go into the forest near the plot and look for signs. Does anyone have any advice on hunting this sort of cryptid? I'll update with any further happenings should they appear again. I worked for a nonprofit that relied on big donations from very wealthy donors. This meant cultivating relationships with some very wealthy people. One of the donors I was tasked with shepherding, let's call him Dan invited me out for a weekend, yachting off of Slash, around Slash near Catalina. I was excited. My partner gets seasick, so we never did boat trips, even though we lived near the coast. Our first night out was beautiful, and we're all lounging on the deck of this gorgeous yacht, talking about eerie ocean stuff. Dan mentions that he has this thin, inflatable roll-out panel that he tethers to the boat and lets float out in the water with 100 feet or so of rope that people can use as a sort of swimming platform. Like this, maybe a bit bigger. We get the idea that we should unfurl this thing into the darkness and experience the freakiness of it at night. I was equal parts frightened and curious, as was everyone else. So a group of four of us did it while two people stayed on the boat. We get the thing out, slide it into the water, check the rope, and push off. It's pretty instantly terrifying. You can see the dim lights on the boat, but after about 40 feet, it seems really, really far away. But it was undeniably awesome, too. We're chatting quietly to ourselves, but mostly we're being quiet and just taking in the weird mix of fear and awe of being so close to the water in the middle of the night. We get to the point where the tether gets taut, and you can immediately feel the current tugging us away from the big boat which again, freaky, but we're confidently tied to the big boat. It's hard to see much of anything other than a few lights on Catalina. 
We're on the ocean side, not the bay side, even though we're not far from shore. I lie back flat on the platform, and everyone else does the same. The water wasn't rough, but it was moving, so you get rocked in random directions. Splashes of water that lip up over the edge and get everyone wet. It was nice. All of a sudden, the feeling of the waves, kind of random and choppy, transitions to a very smooth swell, which makes us all gasp. We're rising, rising, rising quickly but smoothly, and everyone jolts upright. There's virtually no light from the moon, but it's enough for us to notice the gigantic thing just under the surface of the water from us. As soon as we notice it, it's already passing, and it sets in that it must be a massive, massive whale moving right below us, maybe a foot or two down, and we're feeling the water displacement from it. No one makes a peep. I immediately grab the tether and start pulling us in. Others start to help. No one makes a sound until we get back to the big boat, which no one leaves for the rest of the trip. It's all we talk about for the next 24 hours. Needless to say, I now have a healthy fear of the ocean, especially at night. People are tiny. Ocean is big. I'll start by saying I'm 35 male and have been in the military my entire adult life. I consider myself logical, objective, and pragmatic and don't really subscribe to anything paranoidic and don't really subscribe to anything paranormal or anything that involves speculation or faith in general. I only believe in what I personally experience, and this is by far the most unexplainable thing that I've experienced. On my wall in my old apartment was a Pearl Jam set list in a cheap black plastic frame. A long-time friend of mine came to visit one night and we go out for a few drinks. A few drinks turned into a few more, and we both got pretty drunk. We walk back to my place, more like stumble, and enter the apartment. The set list is on the wall that the apartment door opens into, and when we came in, the set list falls off the wall, and a piece of plastic that runs along the length of the frame breaks off when it hits the ground. The piece that broke off was about two inches long and less than half an inch wide. It wasn't super noticeable, but I figured no big deal. I'll replace the frame at some point. I considered super gluing it, but since it's like a $30 frame, I'll just get a new one. Cut to six months later, I'm driving home at around 7 a.m. after working a night shift. I randomly think to myself, shit, I need to get a new frame and decide to take a look at it when I get home. I walk into my apartment drop my work bag, and immediately turn to the frame set list and pull it off the wall to examine it. When I take it off the wall, I realize the frame isn't broken at all. The piece I remembered coming off wasn't broken, and the frame was in perfect condition. At this point, I'm thinking, what the F? Why do I remember this being broken? Whatever, I'm not going to give too much thought to something that isn't an issue, right? Cool. I place the frame back on the wall and bend down to take off my boots. As I'm untying my boot, the frame falls and hits the ground. I grab the frame, pick it up, and turn it towards me to see that the frame had just now broken exactly in the way that I remembered it being broken. A long, skinny piece breaking off the long portion of the frame. I immediately started looking for evidence that I had super glued it, and there's none. I thought maybe I must have and forgot, I guess. That would have been obvious, and I would have noticed that when I initially took it off the wall to inspect it, I immediately called my brother to tell him about it and was blown away and pretty freaked out. It's really the only thing that's ever happened to me that I cannot explain. I ran through every option, and I can't make sense of it. I was under the influence of alcohol when it happened, or so I thought, and then coming off a night shift when it broke again, but that doesn't explain why I have a memory of an event that apparently never happened. Then it happened in the same exact fashion as the memory I already had. The mental image of the broken frame I had in my mind is precisely how it broke right in front of me. Has anyone else ever experienced anything like that? My husband and daughter and I flew to Europe. Before we left, I got my nails painted, something I hardly ever do. 
While on the flight, my husband and I watched a movie. We looked over and seen my daughter passed out in her seat. We laughed because she had said she was going to stay up the whole flight. Typical teenager. We finished our movie and we fell asleep. I don't know for how long, but I woke up and I looked at my husband and he woke up and looked at me. I smiled and I looked down at my nails and I noticed a scratch across my thumbnail where the paint had been removed. It was scratched from left to right. I looked at him and I told him, look at my nail. He said, what did you do? I said, I don't know. Maybe it was getting the luggage up. He said, you should have just let me do it. I said, yeah, I didn't put my hand down. We ended up falling back to sleep. We woke up when we were about to land. I looked at my nail in disappointment and the nail polish was back. I looked at my husband in total confusion and held my hand up to him to show him my thumb. He looked shocked and grabbed my hand and twisted my thumb to see if it had been by accident. We seen it scratched, but no, it was perfect. I said, okay, so you remember me showing you my polish scratched off, right? He said, yay. I said, which way was it scratched? And he drew on my thumbnail left to right. I was in shock. My daughter asked, what's wrong? I said, while you were sleeping, I noticed my nail polish was scratched off. But when I just woke up, it's back on. You're dead, and I both seen it off. She said I was awake the whole trip. I didn't see you talking. You were sleeping the whole trip. I looked at my husband, and he said, no, you were the one sleeping. We have never understood what happened. I think it's either alternate or parallel dimensions or aliens low. Thought I would share this. Edit. I forgot to mention that the dog we took with us on this trip had a totally different personality after. Went hiking up in the Bighorn Mountains in central Wyoming with my wife, brother, and two friends a few years ago. We wanted to try a little off-the-grid camping, so we just found a side road, drove down for a bit, and found a somewhat secluded spot to set up our tents. It was nearly dark by the time we got there and starting to rain, so we made quick work of setting everything up and settling in for the night. About one, my wife wakes me up. Can you hear that? After listening for a second, I say that's just, gee, my bro, snoring, it's fine. About that time, the snoring starts to move. We stay perfectly silent for about ten minutes listening to the sound of whatever. It is roaming around the tents, including the twang of our tent lines being toyed with. We didn't sleep the rest of the night. The next morning, we looked around the tent and realized there were mountain lion tracks circling the tent about half a dozen times. The snoring we heard was actually the cat's chuffing. After waking the others, we made a little circuit around our site. I realized we had set up about 100 yards from a den. We packed up and found another spot pretty quick. My buddy and I used to go into the woods behind our house in Indiana when we were in middle school just about every day. Sometimes we'd find interesting shit or creepy crap like little shit shacks where someone had made a home. But one day we saw two guys, probably early 20s, walking around in the woods, and as we saw them, they saw us. It immediately started towards us. We freaked out and started running away, which they then started walking faster in our direction. After what felt like forever, we came towards the edge of the woods where they had a ton of empty truck trailers parked. Don't know our thought process, but we jumped in one and hid behind some old boxes. We sat there probably an hour. For about 20 minutes of that hour, we heard them running around shouting, Where'd you guys go? I was scared then, but honestly, as an adult, I look back and feel more frightened because I fully understand how nuts people are. Okay, I want to start off by saying that I do not really believe in strange creatures from the abyss, and I am not a huge fan of looking for Bigfoot. I am just a regular guy who saw something that I can't explain. I just want to know if this is something that maybe someone else has seen. I was driving down Route 20 in Northboro, Massachusetts at around 2 a.m. one night in 2007. My girlfriend at the time was in the car with me. 
When we reached a more wooded area, I saw two animals crossing the road. Both of them stopped and turned to look at my oncoming car. When I saw them, I turned on my high beams, thinking they were deer. After a brief moment, they both took about two steps and cleared the road and were in the woods. I looked at my girlfriend, who looked back at me and said, Did you see that? Those were not deer. We made a few jokes about it and ended up calling them the things on Route 20. They had fur on them that was the length of a deer, really short, except the fur was black. Height would be about seven feet tall. Their eyes were reflective, like when a cat looked at you from the dark. The head was deer, like except they had ears that pointed upwards. I know I'm going to get flamed for the next part, but they were standing upright on their back legs like a human would. It's difficult to describe what their legs looked like, but the closest thing that I can say they resembled was, was what a wolf's back legs looked like, where only the ends of the paws were touching the ground, and the ankle is off of the ground. Place your feet under your chair so that only your toes are flat against the floor. Have you heard of something similar to this so I can try to research it further? I am George, a part-time trucker who finds himself on the road transporting animals for a rodeo event in Oklahoma. On one fateful night, as I traversed a desolate highway in the heart of Oklahoma, nature called, and I was in desperate need of a restroom break. I maneuvered my truck to the side of the road and decided to venture into the nearby desert to relieve myself. As I relieved the pressure and an unsettling odor wafted through the air, assaulting my senses with its pungency. Finished with my task, I turned my attention toward the source of the scent, squinting into the distance. To my shock, I beheld an unknown humanoid creature, its presence both fascinating and unnerving. The creature stood tall, approximately eight feet in height, with a complexion that seemed to meld shades of dark gray and hints of brown, a peculiar mane, reminiscent of a male lion's but with shorter hair along its body and legs, adorned its frame. What struck me the most was its ability to walk upright on its hind legs, resembling a distorted fusion of human and animal attributes. As my eyes met its gaze, a shiver crawled down my spine. Glowing with an otherworldly intensity, the creature's eyes held an eerie hue, reminiscent of flickering flames from the depths of the netherworld. Intrigued and unnerved, I reached for the flashlight conveniently placed behind me in the truck cabin. With trembling hands, I aimed the beam toward the mysterious figure, hoping to catch a clearer glimpse of its form. Yet as the light pierced through the darkness, the creature vanished before my eyes, dissolving into the night like a fleeting apparition. The only remnants of its presence were the echoes of my own rapid heartbeat and the lingering questions that danced in my mind. Perplexed and filled with a sense of wonder mixed with trepidation, I retraced my steps back to the truck, pondering the enigma that had unfolded before me. Was this encounter with an unknown creature some kind of cryptid? Or had my mind conjured a fantastical apparition in the solitude of the desert night Throughout the remainder of my journey, the memory of that peculiar creature remained etched in my thoughts. Its existence challenged the boundaries of what I believed to be possible, opening my mind to the vast mysteries that lie concealed within the tapestry of our world. As I continued my trucking endeavors, I carried with me not only the cargo I transported, but also the haunting curiosity of that enigmatic encounter forever etched in my memories. My friend's mom is a big backpacker. In the 80s, she hiked a pretty large portion of the Pacific Crest Trail. On some of her trips, she would go solo. This was one of those trips. She was out there for a little over a week, just hiking and taking pictures and camping along the trail. Anyway, trip goes off without a hitch, and she had a great time. Now, mind you, this was back before digital cameras, so after she got back from her trip, she went to get her film developed. She got her pictures back and was looking through them when suddenly her heart dropped. 
Amongst the pictures she took of all the great landscapes were multiple pictures taken at night of her sleeping. Remember, she was solo on the trip. Someone had seen her on the trail, snuck into her camp at night, and took pictures of her while she slept. For some reason, I want to say, there were pics from multiple places she stayed, like the dude had been following her. But I might be making that part up. She never went solo again. I always try to lean towards a logical explanation. A couple of years ago, my hunting partner and I were doing some bear hunting about six miles in a long way off trail. He slept in a hammock and I was in a tent. I woke up to him screaming at something to get the F out of here and then the sound of him running off into the woods. I immediately thought about how ballsy he was to chase something off into the dark like that. Then he yelled at me from his sleeping spot to get out there with my pistol and light. I was out there in seconds, and he was tangled in his mummy bag and hammock, rifle in hand and ghost white. There was someone standing over me, and I saw their silhouette. They ran when I yelled. This was like 2 a.m., and we never found any trace of anyone the next day. I know what I heard definitely was running on two legs. My buddy used to be the kind of guy that did a bunch of solo backpacking, but now he won't go into the woods overnight alone. A few years ago, I was bow hunting the edge of a bean field in central Oklahoma. First night of the season that I had made it out, and the first time I had hunted this location. Twenty minutes before dark, I have several does feed right out of the woods underneath my stand. They continue to feed right up until dark, and I, of course, am listening for a buck to crunch leaves behind them. Right as it gets almost too dark to shoot, I notice the does get super nervous just suddenly at something across the field. We all know this is normal for a group of does, but they had been chill the entire twenty minutes or so I had watched them. I'm looking around for a buck or maybe a coyote. After 30 seconds or so, the does completely lose it and haul out of there. Just as I'm thinking, man, that is weird. I see a brown figure leaping from the back corner of this 60-acre field and clearing three, four rows of beans at a time. My mind is wondering how in the world a coyote could do that as it's heading straight towards where the does ran into the woods. As the figure crossed closest to me at probably 80 yards, I realized that it was a long-tailed cat. I had never seen one in person at this time, but they are extremely rare in that area. I went from casually thinking it was a coyote to wondering how the heck was I going to get back to my truck in the dark. I decided to carry a firearm while archery hunting after that day. About 13, 15 years ago, my, now, wife and I were driving from Virginia to Tennessee. We were in the mountains on the interstate, I-40 in the middle of nowhere. I don't think I was more than an hour or two past I-80. One, but I could be wrong. It was a while ago. It was pitch black. Late at night, nobody else on the road. A few cars drove by on the other side of the interstate from time to time, heading east not in our direction. However, we were the only car on this stretch of the road in either direction. At the time of our sighting, a large creature ran across the interstate from our left to the right toward the woods. It sort of galloped like a horse, but its mouth, teeth, and face were very canine. Upper body thick, lower body thin, like a dog. Its body somewhat resembled a wolf, but it was too tall to be one, especially for Tennessee's. It was as tall or slightly taller than our car. Its upper body was very thick compared to its lower body. It paused between the lanes, looked at us, then darted into the woods. I'm a logical person, INTJ, but the creature struck fear in both of us. A friend later told me that we might have seen a balding black bear, but given the size and body shape, I just don't think that was the case. We both talk about the sighting from time to time.
For geographic context, I live in the middle of nowhere in Texas between New Mexico and Oklahoma. A lot of open farmland in these parts. I moved back to my childhood home with my father back in May 22, and I had started hearing knocks above my bedroom window on the house at night. One night around 10 or 11 p.m., I was walking from my car to the front door, which is around 50 feet, and I heard someone walk up behind me and ask me what I was doing here. I recently moved back, but all of our neighbors have been here since I was a kid and all knew me. One, they're all old men, too. I know their voices. This wasn't anyone I knew. When I turned around, there wasn't a soul in sight to have run away from where I could see them. It would have been 100 yards to the nearest bush or house behind me. Things are spread far apart in my neighborhood. It's a rural area. I haven't heard voices anymore, but I continue to hear bangs consistently around the front door and the wall. My bed is nearest. I've also been staying in a more populated city with my boyfriend half of the week, and very rarely do I hear the knocks and bangs while I'm there with him. We've also installed doorbell cameras, but they never catch anything. Not even normal explanations for the banging around the door. When the banging happens, the camera is never activated to take a video. This has all been going on for almost a full year now. What do y'all think? I'll never forget that camping trip, the one that left me questioning everything I thought I knew about the woods. My family and I had just moved to Oregon from Colorado, and we were eager to explore our new surroundings. We decided to embark on our first camping trip in our new state, choosing a spot at the base of Mount Hood near Clear Lake. Little did we know what awaited us. We passed several campsites as we drove around the lake, eventually turning off onto a very overgrown road. Our four-wheelers strained under the onslaught of branches and bushes, but we pressed on, determined to find the perfect campsite. When we finally arrived at our destination, we were surprised to find a huge pile of firewood, enough to last us for days. Strange, I thought, wondering if the previous campers had heard something unsettling and decided to leave in a hurry. As we set up camp, our usually calm dog began to act strangely, barking and growling at seemingly nothing. We dismissed his behavior as a reaction to the new environment and carried on, not realizing the significance of his actions. That night, as we sat around the fire, we heard strange noises coming from the woods. At first, we thought it might be other campers playing a prank on us, but the sounds grew more and more unnerving. It was as if someone, or something, was circling our campsite, watching us from the shadows. As the hours passed, the noises intensified, and our dog grew increasingly agitated. Fear crept into our hearts as we huddled together, wondering what could be lurking out there in the dark. Finally unable to bear the tension any longer, we decided to pack up and leave. We hastily gathered our belongings and piled into the four-wheeler our dog still barking and snarling at the unseen presence. When we returned to Clear Lake the following summer, we discovered that the road leading to our campsite had been closed. The reasons for the closure remain unknown, but I can't help but wonder if others had experienced the same unsettling events we had. I don't know what we encountered that night, but one thing is certain. The memory of that camping trip will stay with me for the rest of my life. A chilling reminder of the mysteries that lurk in the shadows of the woods. Let me start off by saying my husband is native, and this happened about six years before I met him. My ex-husband was stationed in San Diego, and I flew out there to visit him. Unfortunately, I wasn't allowed to stay with him on the base for whatever reason. Don't ask me! "'cause I don't even know myself. "'Also, I should add, I had just given birth about three months before this, "'and I had my son with me. "'Anyway, I found a hotel that wasn't far from the base "'and close to food and whatnot. "'I went out to get some food and then walked back to the hotel "'since it wasn't far. "'Unfortunately, with my horrible sense of direction, "'I got lost and ended up near a wooded area, "'but there was a highway also nearby.' 
It was getting close to sunset, and I started seeing sets of shining eyes, and I thought they were just coyote. I'm not afraid of much. After about twenty minutes, one set of shining eyes got closer, and I saw it was a coyote. I watched Steve Irwin as a teenager and remembered that if you make yourself appear bigger, and remembered that if you make yourself appear bigger and loud off. So I started clapping my hands and shouting. This one, however, didn't. It stood up and started walking like a person. I've never run away from something so fast. It never followed me, and I wasn't going to stick around to find out what it was. It wasn't until I met my current husband that I found out what it was and the look on his face when I told him this story. He went pale. He never said anything. He just kind of nodded like he understood. Maybe it knew I was still semi-healing from having recently given birth, or it saw my son in the stroller. I was pushing and just wanted to scare me. Either way, I don't know. I just know it succeeded in scaring me. This isn't really a question, it's more or less me telling the story of how I saw a skinwalker and didn't even know what it was at the time. My parents' house was always a place of comfort for me, a sanctuary, until the day my grandmother passed away. My mother, being the oldest, inherited the family Bible. It was an ancient tomb filled with brittle pages of scripture and, oddly enough, locks of hair from generations past. None of the hair was labeled, the identities of their owners lost to time. Things started to change in the house after the Bible came into our possession. It began with the light switches. We'd walk into a room only to find the lights turned off when we were certain they'd been left on. We shrugged it off as faulty wiring or forgetfulness. When my divorce was finalized, my two children and I moved into my parents' home. One night, while my children slept soundly in their beds, I was startled awake by a peculiar sensation. I could feel a pressure on the bed as though someone was sitting on the edge. The blankets were taut, the mattress creaked under the weight. I sat up looking around the dimly lit room but found nothing. I brushed it off as a dream, a figment of my overactive imagination. But it happened again, and again, every time, it was the same. The sensation of someone sitting on the bed, the mattress groaning under the phantom weight. I checked on my two-year-old each time, expecting to find him out of his bed, but he was always sound asleep. The incidents shook me, but I kept them to myself, not wanting to worry my children or parents. It wasn't until my sister came to visit that I realized I wasn't alone in my experiences. She'd been staying in the upstairs room, and one day, over coffee, she confided in me. Her stories mirrored my own. The feeling of an unseen presence. The sensation of someone sitting on her bed. We exchanged uneasy glances. A silent acknowledgement of the uncanny events taking place in our childhood home. We still don't know what to make of it. The old family Bible sits on the bookshelf, a relic of the past. Its pages filled with scripture and strands of hair. But the house feels different now. It's as if we're sharing it with someone else, someone we can't see. It's no longer just our home. It's theirs, too. But who they are, we may never know. New to the group, so wanted to share an experience I had back in the spring of 2018. I have had a few what could be considered paranormal experiences in my life, but this was the most recent and unnerving. I am an avid outdoorsman and love to hunt and camp around the Francis Marion and Sumter National Forest. Back in 2018, I took my young son and dog out to a remote area in the National Forest to test out a new camper shell on my recently purchased truck. We found the secluded area off a dirt road, made dinner, and then packed it in for the night as soon as it got dark. Around 11 p.m. at night, I sat up and looked out the back of the truck due to my dog growling. In the distance, I saw what looked like hundreds of small white balls of light darting around then hovering for a few seconds and slowly converging to our campsite. They looked just like the dust orbs you see on videos, but these were producing light in a completely dark forest. They soon surrounded my truck, seemed like hundreds of them. They were a soft white light, 
and they didn't blink. Lighting bugs were out early evening, but those were yellow and blinking. After thirty minutes of them floating around and concentrating around us, I finally worked up the nerve to open the truck and lit a lantern, and they promptly disappeared. After turning off the lights and locking back up, they came back. My son was fast asleep, thank goodness. I watched them until I finally fell asleep around 1 a.m. The next morning when we tried to leave, the battery was dead on the new truck. There wasn't any lights in the back cab where we would have used any power. A week later, I had to replace the electric control module. Not sure if that is relevant info, but thought I would edit. Has anyone had a similar experience? Just thinking about them again makes the hair stand up on my neck. This wasn't while hiking, but once a friend and I were driving on an old dirt road way out in the sticks in South Alabama, past an old 19th century cemetery, when out of nowhere, a truck starts tailgating us. This was really late at night, and even in the daytime, it would have been rare to see a vehicle, so we were a little creeped out. I speed up, and the truck stays right on my bumper. I'm now driving as fast as I can without flying off the road on this small, windy dirt road. Think Dukes of Hazard only in a Volvo station wagon, and still can't shake the truck. My buddy, who was with me, knew the area well and said that we were about to hit a paved road too bone intersection and that there was also another small dirt road coming off at a sharp angle from that intersection he said that if i could get ahead just enough to get out of immediate sight of the truck then i could cut the wheel hard to the left and whip into the spur road and hopefully ditch the truck i did what he said but right when i start the turn at the t-bone i see what looks like an incredibly tall person just inside the tree line across the paved road covered head to toe in long hair as i'm turning i shout holy shit do you see and before i can finish my friend says that big tall hairy guy i finished the turn we ditched the truck and got the hell out of there but to this day we really don't know what we saw Driving through Idaho once in the dead of night, and there was this biker who'd been following for the last 50 miles. When you drive sometimes, it's just you and someone else for long stretches. I call them road buddies. He was my road buddy. I don't know when it happened, but I checked my mirror and he wasn't there anymore. There wasn't really anywhere to turn off, but maybe he pulled over for one reason or another. I look back up and there is a biker in front of me. I don't know if it's the same guy or not. Again, there's not really anywhere to pull over. It's just a bunch of flat, dry land with simple fencing on either side. I follow the guy for a mile or so, and all of a sudden he pitches hard right like he just took a pothole the worst way possible. I saw him tumble and watched his bike kick up a huge cloud of dust. We're not supposed to pull over or pick up hitchhikers, but in this kind of situation... I don't care what the company says. I pulled right over and got out, left the keys in it and everything. I walked back, must have been a quarter mile or more, and couldn't find Hyde nor hair of him or his bike. There were no marks from where he pulled off and no potholes either. I walked around calling out to him the dark for what felt like half an hour before walking back to my truck. When I climbed in there, he was sitting in my passenger seat. He was covered in blood, twigs, and dirt. His leg had been snapped off at the knee, and he had taken off his belt to make a tourniquet. He, his middle through pinky fingers, were pushed back and standing straight up. I asked him if he was okay, but he didn't say anything. He just sat there, silent. I tried to touch his shoulder to see if he was even awake, and his jaw fell open, and he let loose a hideous scream that still chills me to this day. His head fell forward, and he started vomiting blood. I screamed and fell backward out of my truck. I woke up, apparently, a few hours later with a state trooper asking me if I was okay. He was pretty smug about the whole thing and acted like I was making it up. I guess they found a teener of meth on the passenger seat and said it belonged to me. I tried telling them about the ghost rider, but nobody would listen.
My dad and I have always loved the great outdoors, the thrill of hiking, the serenity of nature, the chance to bond and the allure of camping under the stars. So we'd planned a weekend trip to the mountains to get our nature fix. We'd found an ideal spot away from the beaten path, and had just set up our tents for the night, when an eerie sound cut through the tranquil silence, screams echoing from deeper within the woods. Now, as a pair of sensible black folks, we weren't about to stick around and investigate the source of those screams. Mountains folks eating people. Nope, not a scenario we were interested in starring in. We quickly packed up our stuff, doused the fire, and without another word hopped into our car to find a different camping spot. As we moved further away from the spine, chilling sounds, we decided to make a pit stop at a convenience store at the foot of the mountains. The clerk was a local, a friendly old chap who'd probably seen more sunsets than there were pebbles on the mountains. We casually mentioned the screams we'd heard, expecting him to be as alarmed as we were. But his reaction was quite the opposite. He laughed, a hearty laugh that seemed to shake his entire frame. When he finally calmed down, he wiped a tear from his eye and told us what was really going on. Turns out, those weren't screams of horror we'd heard, but sounds of pleasure. The local tradition was something we had not anticipated. A yearly outdoor orgy for people who dressed up in animal costumes. A furry gathering, if you will. This eccentric group had been congregating in the mountains for years, as per the clerk, and we had unwittingly set camp right in the heart of their rendezvous spot. We drove away, laughter replacing the fear in our hearts. Our father-son camping trip had taken a strange turn, certainly, but it was one for the books, an unusual story to tell around future campfires, a peculiar local tradition that we'll always associate with our love for camping. Needless to say, we made a mental note to do better research about local traditions before choosing our next camping spot. Before I get started, uh, I would like to make a disclaimer that this will be a lengthy post, so forgive me for any grammatical errors or run-ons. Also, I am retelling each story as well as it was told to me. I will not be changing any descriptions that are compared to movies as to be appeased any skeptics who don't believe these accounts solely because the eyewitness makes a film comparison. Furthermore, all three of these incidents were told to me over the years from three very different people who have no connection to each other. I never shared the other stories I heard about this family to the person sharing their own account as to not influence their own memory or story. I just let them confide in me their own experience with this family. First story. I went to high school with a well-known, successful, pow-wow dancer competitor. And this was his story. He began dating this girl from a large family prominent in the pow-wow competition world. The parents of the large family were not employed, and the father performed odd jobs around the community. Their main source of income was the monetary prizes and winnings from competing in pow-wows. Having a large family with no stable income resulted in them being low on the socioeconomic ladder. Being from a small rural res town, there isn't much to do for date night. So it is very common to drive around on old dirt roads and park and stargaze. One night, he picks up the youngest daughter to spend time together. However, that night, they opt to stay parked in his car on her family's property. Most Navajo families have their homes in small circular networks, such as a cul de sac, minus the paved round about. There is a derelict traditional mud roof, Hogan, on the property. The roof was caved in, but the framing for the doorway was still intact. Oddly enough, there was still a raggedly old Navajo blanket draped over the doorway, lightly flapping in the wind. He says all of a sudden the dogs started howling and barking. They both stopped talking and stared at the dogs. Something had the dogs' attention. The dogs target their alarmed barking at the doorway of the old Hogan. He feels uneasy but tries to hide it. She is still smiling and unfazed by all the commotion. The blanket stops flapping in the wind and falls flat. 
It's eerily silent except for the howling of the dogs. Suddenly something rips through the doorway of the old Hogan. As this figure exits the Hogan, the dogs begin to chase it. He told me it was a fucking werewolf. He said it looked exactly how the lichens looked in Underworld, the movie, except not muscular. Like a sickly, emaciated werewolf. He said it takes about three long strides before jumping incredibly high straight into the tree. The dogs continue to chase it and cry off into the distance. He is in complete shock. He realizes that his girl's reaction did not match his. She seemed familiar or unafraid. In the moments following, he said she seemed to, for lack of a better word, tried to gaslight him. She began to tease him in an unfunny way and emasculate him by insinuating he was afraid. She said things like, Oh, you're afraid of skinwalkers. Long story short, they eventually ended their relationship. It was a very ugly split. He said her family was nasty, etc. He said he should listen to all the other pow-wow community members when they warned him that. That family was bad, and they dealt in bad medicine. Second story. The older siblings of that family all shared residence in Phoenix. It is very common for people from the res to move to the valley after high school. The older siblings weren't any different. This story was told to me by another young Navajo man. Just like the first, he didn't believe in traditional values. He believed that. ESW, spiritual healing, medicine men, etc. were all myth. At the time, he was dating the second youngest daughter. He expressed that her older brothers didn't like him and on many occasions tried to physically fight him. The SW family members were known partiers and on many occasions would throw res parties, parties in the city with all or most attendees being from the res. The older brothers despised him. However, he recalled that they would call a ceasefire, so to speak, during house parties. He said they would even be so kind as to even make him mix drinks or bring him beers. He didn't think anything of it. As nice as the brothers appeared, he still wasn't allowed to spend the night with his girlfriend under their roof. So after the house parties would dwindle down and end, he found himself behind the wheel of his car, driving back to his own apartment. He would never remember getting into his vehicle, driving home, or getting pulled over. He believed he was just blacking out from the alcohol. I know it is very dangerous to get behind the wheel and drink and drive. Mind you, this is his story, and I'm only repeating what he said, and I'm not condoning any of it. Him and his girlfriend loved each other, so he always returned to spend time with her. Fast forward to the next four house parties, and the same thing kept happening. He would spend the night in jail and rack up another DUI. Pretty soon, he had four or six DUIs. He did time and paid the fines. He lost his job and his lifestyle. His mother, who was a very traditional Navajo woman and single mother, begged him to come home back to the res and get his life sorted. Without any other prospects, he decided to come back to the res. Upon returning home, his mother drove him to see a medicine woman. Feeling hopeless and lost, he thought, what could it hurt, right? If he didn't believe in it or it didn't exist, what is the harm? Nothing lost. Nothing gained mentality. At least it would satisfy his mother's anxiety. He was shocked that by looking into the fire, the medicine woman told him in detail everything. He had never met this medicine woman before, or up until this point had never been to a ceremony. She told him that she saw him drinking and partying with S.W. She told him that the alcoholic drinks they were offering him were laced with corpse powder. She saw their hatred for him. Their bad medicine was meant to be fatal. They were trying to kill him. She said had those cops never pulled him over, each time he would continue on his way to his death. At the point of returning home, him and that girl had broken up due to his trouble with the law and troubles with drinking. Third story. This story was told to me by a gay Navajo man who had a long-standing, strictly platonic friendship with one of the brothers. They had gone to high school together and had remained friends in life. This happened at one of the aforementioned notorious Riz parties the S.W. family members used to host. The other brothers got upset and visibly angry that there was a gay man at their party. They wanted him to leave or else there would be trouble. The gay man told his friend that he would gladly leave to avoid any drama. However, he pleaded with him to stay and enjoy the festivities. 
The gay man was told to wait in the friend's room while the friend sorted everything out and calmed down his brother. About 30 to 45 minutes passes. He decides it isn't worth the trouble and he is just going to leave. He walks down the back stairwell that directly leads to the garage. As he slowly and quietly descends, he begins to hear the brothers arguing. He stands silent and begins to listen. He can hear the familiar voice of his friend pleading with his brothers. He repeatedly hears his friend command his brothers not to fight him or put anything on him. On the res, any form of the phrase, put anything on him, someone roughly translates to when someone witches another person. If someone witches another person, they put bad medicine on them. So the term put anything on him can only mean putting bad medicine or cursing. It's just common sense knowledge on the res. If you are not from the res, you may have many ways to interpret that phrase, but there is only one meaning on the res. He is shocked about what he hears and slowly backtracks up the stairs and finds another way out of the house. He leaves and never goes to another party there. It is said among the members of the small town that the Pow Wow family are skinwalkers who curse their rivals in order to win Pow Wow competitions. If you're from the Rez, I'm sure you might have heard of this family or have even heard stories yourself. There was many times that you would smell them and hear them. My dad and I used to go running at night up to the falls. It is just down the old logging road from our house. There are no lights out there. All you have is the moon on a good night, so it was very dark. We had just enough light to see, but not a full moon. And there is his high brush and, and trees on both sides of the road. We were just getting close to the falls when we stared to smell it. There is no way to put it to words. It's musty and rotten and a little like wet dirt. We had no idea that it was just up ahead about 50 feet or so. It moved so fast that you could not really see it. Just a big, fast, dark movement, but we heard it hit the brush like a truck. The brush here is very dense with a lot of blackberry vines and trees. It just crashed through them like they were nothing. It moved through the brush going to the falls and you couldn't hear it anymore. Dad and I knew what it was. They are up there all the time. You hear them, smell them. They get up in the trees and throw things around, so we weren't all that socked. But this one was closer than normal, so we went home. The next day, we went back and found that it had cut a path through the brush, almost nine feet wide, and smashed everything in its path. Small trees were just broken off, and grooves were left in the ground about every eight feet or so. I don't know how long it was. We didn't want to walk it. In closing, I would like to say that I had been around all kinds of animals and have smelled bear, and yes, they are up there too. But the bear up there are not so big, and bear does not smell like that. If you ever smelled it, you would know the difference. This happened to me two years ago when I took my fiancé on her first backcountry camping trip. I have always been a bigger camper and love backpacking backcountry, and so I thought I would take her to one of my favorite places. This was in early September and was kind of an end of summer trip. It was her and I, along with my dog. We were backpacking up to a lake in the Alpine Lakes Wilderness, which is a remote area in the Cascades just east from Seattle. It is about a one two-day hike up depending on your shape and how quickly you are trying to get it ill. It is very deep and far away from any civilization. The trailhead we started on is about an hour and a half from any town, and not many people use it. We park, and there are no other cars around, and we decide to get started. We had been hiking for six or seven hours, and everything is going normal, until one random moment. My dog was running without his leash on. I always keep him off leash when we are back country and is about 100 feet up the trail ahead of us when he stops and starts snarling and whining. I think that maybe he sees something and get my bear spray out just in case it may be a black bear or something. Instead, out pops this older man, probably in his late 50s with a huge beard and he looked really dirty and homeless with a very small pack. My dog starts freaking out and barking at this point. 
which is strange because he usually loves people. I put my spray away and leash my dog, and the guy stops to talk to us, and I apologize for my dog. There was something off about him. I'm not sure what it was, but he was strange, asking us where we were going, how long we were going to be staying, etc. I was getting this strange vibe and eventually try to cut the conversation short with him and tell him we have to keep going. We part ways and continue on, and I can tell me fiancé is kind of creeped out by it. At this point, I try not to think much of it because I have come across strange people on the trail all the time. She is scared, saying, but we are so far away from other people, what would happen if he tried to hurt us, etc.? I try to calm her down and say she is safe with me. About one hour later, it's getting dark, and I decide to stop and make camp. As the night goes on, she forgets about the whole thing, and we get ready to go to bed. We fall asleep, and all is good, until I wake up in the middle of the night to my dog growling under his breath, staring out of our tent. I look out and try to see if anything was there. The moon was out, and it was a clear sky, and as my eyes adjust, I start making out a figure of a man. I start freaking the F out and begin thinking about the guy we ran into before. Why the F is he outside our tent this late? Why would he turn around and come back up the trail if he was hiking out? I try to hush my dog and prevent my fiancé from waking up to prevent her from freaking out as well. I slowly slipped my hand into my pack and pulled my three hundred fifty seven caliber out of my pack that I always carry loaded with me back country and laid there trying to keep my eyes on him. I laid there for what felt like hours, until eventually he just kind of slipped away into the darkness. I didn't go back to sleep and laid there until the sun came up, freaking out at any sound of moment or twigs breaking. The next morning we wake up and I tell my fiancé that we should just go look at the lake and head back. It was only an hour or so away at that point. She was confused but didn't ask why. I didn't want to freak her out and tell her what happened the night before. But I really wanted to get the F out of there. The whole way up to the lake and hiking out to our car I kept my three hundred fifty seven caliber on my waist with my hand close to it. We never ran into him or saw him again, and I never told my fiancé about what happened because I didn't want her to be afraid of future trips. But it still creeps me out, and I can't figure out why the F he came back up there and what he was planning on doing. I was just grateful I had my gun and dog, otherwise I probably would been even more freaked out. My dad told me this story. He swears on his life it's true. Well, anyway, his friends owned a plane and was going to fly up and try to spot some elk. They spotted some and stuck my dad off into the woods. Around four o'clock, nothing was seen, so he was walking through this clear cut and heard a usual sound. He looked up and seen an animal standing on two legs that was screaming at him. He said that it was grayish in color. He said it was around 100 yards away, and no way possible could have been a bear. He also said it made some of the weirdest noises he'd ever heard. After it was done screaming at whatever, he said it turned around and walked back into the forest on two legs. Went on my first solo camping trip when I was around 21 years old. Took my miniature Doc Chun with me. Stayed in a remote campground where there was hardly anyone around. In the middle of the night, I was woken up several times by the sound of chanting, yelling, and singing from across the river. Not in the campground itself, but within hearing distance. Freaked out, I snuggled up to my dog and finally fell asleep with her on my chest. In the middle of the night, I woke up with a jolt of chill going through my body opened my eyes, tipped my head back, and looked through the tiny square vent in the tent directly behind my head. An older man's face was looking in at me through the tent window, a man with long black hair and big black eyes. I was so terrified I couldn't move. I couldn't even make a sound. I certainly tried. At some point, my dog, a miniature Dachshund, sensed my tension and woke up too. She was still sleeping smack dab in the center of my chest. She looked out the window directly at whatever it was that was behind me and let out a single sharp growling bark. 
The moment she barked, my body relaxed and I was able to move again. And I realized I may have been asleep and experiencing sleep paralysis the whole time. There was nobody behind the tent anymore. It's very possible it was all a very realistic, freaky dream. I'm not a hunter, but I do live in Colorado and frequent the mountains often. My first scary thing was my friend and I were going to an off-road spot, and it was a two-day trip. We took my truck, which doesn't have a camper. Anyway, we pull off the main road to an outcropping that was a pull-off area next to a river and bust out some beers, a little grill, and just kick back for a bit. Once we got done eating, I kept hearing this growling noise across the stream. I asked my buddy about it, and he wrote it off like I was nuts. We start unpacking the tent and put it together, and sure enough, the growling gets louder, and two glowing eyes are pacing the bank in front of us. He notices it. We both freak out and throw the tent, complete and all in the truck and bailout. We ended up sleeping in the back of the truck about two miles away, totally freaked out. Different time when I was younger. We went to Apex Road. It was my first time there, and what's common for everyone else freaked me out. There's a 40-ish foot steel cross erected that looks like it was made out of leftover metal. There's an abandoned mine shaft and also an old abandoned school that when we inspected it at dusk, had whispering sounds come from it. That was nutty. Now keep in mind this stuff was easily a hundred years old, but in order to get to the top of it, you need four wheel drive and there's eight or nine switchbacks that are scary as F. It blows my mind someone settled up there at one point. I'm from a small Midwestern town, and nothing like what I saw happens here, to my knowledge, and is pretty much completely normal. This took place in the fall of my seventh grade, so around 2016. Even though it was a few years ago, I know that I saw something, but... I'm not 100% sure what I saw. By the way, I'm telling this in first person simply because it's easier. My mom called up the stairs. I quickly went towards her voice as she began to explain. Your dad and I are heading out for the night. Do you mind walking the dog before we leave? I simply nodded in response, clipping in the dog's leash as she continued talking about what they were doing that night. It was a late November night and the sun had already set. By the time my mom finished talking, the dog was clipped in and ready to go. I closed the front door and immediately felt chills, not only from the temperature, but the atmosphere. Not one person was out. It's not that late, is it? I said to myself. I had made it half a street when my dog stopped to sniff something on the ground. I looked out at the road ahead, nothing but houses and a one-stop sign. My brain immediately thought back to a dumb video my friend and I watched trying to scare ourselves in class where, just like me, someone walking looks up at a stop sign to see a woman staring back at them, literally standing on the stop sign. I still couldn't shake a creepy feeling as I looked down the road. Then my heart stopped. I'll try my best to describe the horrifying sight I saw. Looking back at me was about an eight, nine foot tall, shadowy figure. It was something humanoid with two legs, tall and skinny. The arms were even longer reaching the ground, but just as skinny. The body was slightly round, complete with a long, skinny neck and no face. Once again, I say no face. I was purely terrified. I pulled my dog to run, but she was frozen. I yelled out to her, making it here then see me in the process. It began to follow us in what... I can only call a drunk on a tightrope walk. In response, I ran, cutting through my neighbor's backyard in the process. I slipped and fell all while running on the muddy grass. I turned around, picking up my dog in one motion. It was even closer now. My head was pounding as I ran with tears in my eyes. Turning around, I fixed my grip on the dog and ran for my life. I opened my back door, throwing us inside. It's going to get me. I yell as my parents run to me. Thank God they hadn't left yet. Truly believing I was almost kidnapped, my dad ran outside. I sat for the next few minutes sobbing, trying to explain the events that just occurred to my mom. 
My dad walked in through the back door and simply said there's no one. Ever since that day, I've had terrible problems with anxiety and depression. To be fair, it could have nothing to do with what I saw, but I have to think that a small part of it was from the pure terror I saw that day. So I live in a really small town in Washington State. That means super high grocery prices at a small town grocery store, so I hardly ever visit this place and do most of my shopping 20 miles away. In town, I only shop there when I don't really feel like driving all the way into town for just a few items or need it ASAP. The store I went to recently had self-serve registers installed, and of course cameras go along with it that watch each and every item that you scan. There are four registers, and all are watched by one employee. Got up to the register with three items in hand and my 15-year-old daughter behind me who was not carrying anything. I put the three items onto the counter and scanned one by one. Once I was done, I tried to pay, but the register was going off, saying that I needed help. Okay, weight was off on one item. I was thinking, employee comes up and sees that there are five items on my list, but only three in the bagging area. She asks me, where are the other two items? I told her, I only came up with three items to begin with, and she watched me scan all of them, so I don't know what other two items she was talking about. My daughter also said she only saw me scan three items. All different. So here's the weird part. The cashier played back the video from the camera above the register, and sure enough, there were two items being scanned by me in the video that I never even showed up with. Clear as day. These were high-definition cameras, and the items were a pack of paper towels and a candy bar. The three items I came up with were milk, sour cream, and ice cream. The cashier freaked out, and of course so did I, because there is no doubt it was me in the camera, because the clothes, my bald spot, and my daughter are right next to me. This gave me chills, seeing myself on the camera, scanning something that I didn't even bring up to the registers. Cashier told me to just pay and get out of the store. This was about two years ago. To this day, I'm still confused as hell as to how this happened. I'm a skeptic of anything paranormal and or unexplained and can usually debunk most things. But damn, this even has me stumped hardcore. This happened to me a good 23 years ago, but it is stuck in my mind clear as day. I was working in one of my first proper jobs in an office as a receptionist. I picked up a phone at one point intending to dial out, and I heard people speaking. I sort of just froze at first, part surprise and part curiosity, I guess. This was the conversation snippet I heard. Man, it happens sometimes when you dial nine to get an outside line. Woman. Yeah, I hung up then because I assumed I'd forgotten to cut off my end of the call when transferring one or had somehow accidentally dialed in. Anyway, later that day, I went to make an external call and pressed nine to get an outside line. I must have pressed it more than once because before I knew it, nine, 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 what is your emergency? Came through. In a panic, I hung up. The phone rang a few minutes later. It was the call handler. A man asking if everything was okay and why 999 had been called and hung up on. I explained to him I didn't mean to call, and I kid you not a word, for word repeat of what was said above happened, and in, in that moment I realized that the woman on the phone was me, and this was the phone call I'd just heard on picking up the phone. I'm a skeptic with a lot of this sort of stuff, but to this day I've not been able to rationalize it away. I was sober, wider awake at work, and it definitely happened. Thoughts? I grew up in western Colorado, not too far from the Utah border. There are old roads going everywhere in the desert out there. You can go for days and days without seeing another soul. Pretty remote. I was around 17 when a good friend and I acquired some magic mushrooms, 
We, being super in touch with nature and stuff, decided to go into the desert for a couple of days and find our spirit animals, or whatever silly shit you do on mushrooms. My friend ended up having to postpone for a day. Don't remember why, but I was bum. I made the decision to just go out alone the first night and get good and drunk for a day. Good decisions abound. After followed an old road for several hours that took me into Utah, I ended up at the bottom of a canyon next to the Colorado River. There was a beautiful sandbar out in the river a bit that I decided to make my camp on. I didn't want to get my old Toyota pickup stuck trying drive to it and figure my friend coming later would see my truck and have an easy time finding me if he didn't have reception to call me. So I just made a few trips wading through about knee-deep water to bring my camping stuff, which consisted of fishing pole, guitar for sweet jams, handle of super top-shelf plastic bottle whiskey, vanilla coke to make whiskey taste slightly less of death, portable CD player, also for sweet jams, sleeping mat, water for the hangover, snacks tarp, and my handy-dandy SKS. Super cheap semi-auto rifle that shoots the same bullet as an AK, because mountain lands. So I settle in a bit and discover the, the side of the sandbar facing the river was covered in driftwood. Being an excellent friend, I decided to make a cool campsite with the driftwood for when my buddy arrived. Drinking shit whiskey, let's call it shitski from now on, and building a driftwood camp in the desert sun on a river was a great way to spend a day. Ten of ten. There was a fire pit with benches, a little shelter with a smaller pit to keep drinks and snacks from cooking in the sun. All good and functional campsite stuff. Then Shitsky started to wrap its fingers around my brain. The stuff I made became less functional. Totem poles, longer pieces, just sunk into the sand like a mini driftwood forest, etc. As night set in, I built a nice fire and decided to crank up the aforementioned sweet jams and go catfishing. I had early success with my endeavor and decided to eat the freshly caught catfish. After my delicious, well-deserved meal, I decided to honor the magnificent beast by placing its head on the top of one of my driftwood totems. Shortly thereafter, the Shitsky finished me off, and I apparently decided slightly wet sand was a good place to rest my bones. I was awakened at far to early an hour, covered in insect bites with a terrible, terrible headache. What had awoken me from my drunken slumber and was compounding the effects of the headache was a colony of loud-ass birds nesting on the cliff opposite the river from me. I don't know what kind they were but the sound was more than I could bear in my state. Idiot logic kicked in, and I decided to silence them by firing Mr. SKS in their general direction, which didn't work. Don't worry, I made sure not to hit their nests or anywhere near them. I am not a murderer unless you are a delicious catfish. At this exact moment, a tour group of rafters came around the bend just upriver from me. Having just heard rifle shots, they were all dead silent and staring at me in horror. There I was, in all my young, stupid glory, standing in my tidy whities covered in bug bites, my long hippie hair looking exactly like I had spent the night sleeping in wet sand, holding a Chinese assault rifle, surrounded by totem poles and all sorts of weird shit. This banquet of what the F being garnished by a catfish head on a stick. I fully realize this region receives a lot of revenue from tourism, and I didn't want to be that asshole that ruins it for everyone, so I put on my best smile, made sure my junk wasn't showing, and slowly waved as they very slowly floated past. Not one of them moved. They just stared, frozen in either horror or awe, maybe both. I was about eight years old when I went camping with my mom and her boyfriend at the time out in central Florida between Tampa and Daytona, just a bit more south. We set up a fire and had hot dogs over the fire. At about eleven of my mom, after having a few glasses of wine, decided she was cold and being eaten alive by mosquitoes and decided to go to her tent and sleep. I asked for my own tent, so I set up mine for my mom's about 20 yards away. 
Fast forward about four hours later, I'm woken up by thick or heavy footsteps by my tent. I figured it was my mom or her boyfriend going to the bathroom, so I didn't think anything of it until I heard more. More and more, I heard footsteps near my tent, and I laid motionless. I was absolutely petrified. There was about four sets of feet pounding the dirt inches from my tent. The fire was out, and it was a pitch-black night, and then I saw two lights. One was red, and the other was a flash of white. Not like a picture, more like a blink or a strobe that was cut off. The red light stared directly at me like it knew exactly where I was. After what felt like four hours, the sound of the steps faded off, and I hauled ass to my mom's tent to wake her and my boyfriend. The most startling part was the morning after. My mom woke me up in a flurry, and we left the campsite early in the morning. Everything was almost packed and was shoved into our Bronco. She never told me why. As a young member of my Native American community named Maya, I felt a deep sense of concern for the fading traditions and stories of our ancestors. Our small community was struggling to preserve our rich cultural heritage in the face of modern influences. Determined to reconnect with our roots and revitalize our heritage, I embarked on a quest to uncover and document the lost stories from an old library. As I delved into the stacks of the ancient library, the musty scent of aged books filled my nostrils, and I ran my fingers gently along the spines of the forgotten stories. Amongst the volumes, I discovered a weathered book that caught my attention. Its pages were yellowed with time, and the title read, The Story of the Mysterious Creature. Intrigued, I carefully opened the book and began to read the story of a native Sioux tribe from a century ago. The story recounted a haunting encounter with a terrifying creature that had plagued their land. The description sent shivers down my spine, and I couldn't help but visualize the creature in my mind's eye. The story detailed an otherworldly being with a round, human-sized head, devoid of a beak but adorned with huge, bat-like wings. Its body stretched five to six feet in length and had a wingspan of an astonishing twenty-five to thirty feet. There were no feathers to be found, only jet-black, bat-like skin. Adding to its eerie presence was a long, skinny tail, reminiscent of a rat or dragon, which stuck straight out for about four to five feet. Unlike a bird, this creature didn't soar gracefully through the sky. Instead, it glided at a plodding speed, maintaining a consistent ten feet off the ground. After covering a short distance, it would take one powerful flap of its wings, never altering its altitude, and glide up the road until disappearing into the depths of the woods. The creature attacked that small Sioux tribe, leaving devastation and heartbreak in its wake. Surviving tribe members wept for the loss of their loved ones. Their anguish mingled with a determination to ensure the story would not be forgotten. They vowed to document every detail, preserving the memory of those who perished and the terror they had faced. In the early 80s, I worked in a hospital doing maintenance. I started on the 11 p.m., 7 a.m. shift. I was the only person in the main engineering plant behind the actual hospital where the boiler pumps, assay equipment, etc. was. It's pretty much like you see in the movies with steam pipes everywhere and whatnot, just better lighting. After a few weeks, I started to notice movement at the edges of my vision, like someone jumping behind a metal tank or ducking behind an electric motor. There were times I thought it was the guy I knew from hospital security because he was the only one else who had a key. Every time I'd check it out, though, I'd find a big, fat nothing. It was creepy, but I chalked it up to just some quirk of the mind playing tricks. I finally mentioned to the day shift guy who worked the 11-7 before me that I thought I was going crazy seeing this phantom thing always at the periphery of my vision. He got super serious and said he was relieved to be off that shift, because he used to see him all the time, too. I moved on to a different type job not long after. The hospital implant is still there. I should drop by and talk to the night shift guy. A 
Apologies if this isn't allowed. I got to thinking after a couple of weird things I experienced in my hometown, and it had me thinking. If anybody else has experienced anything, back when we were teens, me and my brother were out for a walk outside of our neighborhood. Where we were walking was kind of wooded, but the houses were still pretty close together, yet considerably more in the boonies compared to our place. Anyways, we had almost completed the loop of the area and were around the bend going toward the exit when we heard something. Odd. I remember there was a helicopter overhead around the time we both heard this weird guttural yell growl, like right next to us it was so damn close. It sounded like a mix between a mountain lion, a pissed off house cat, and yet oddly human like all at once. We both just froze and looked at each other startled, and I started looking around for the source, but there wasn't a single cat or anything animal-like about. I was pretty freaked out and practically sped walked to the road. All the while, my brother kept asking me what the E of that was, but I was too spooked to talk about it. It was like a primal-type fear. In an instant, we heard it, and I just kept looking over my shoulder the whole way back. Anyways, pretty benign compared to other stories I've read here, and I'm sure there's an explanation to the sound, but it did have me wondering, has anyone else experienced weird shit in Florida? I was a watch officer on a big semester at Sea Square Rigged Sailing Ship. We had just pulled into Porto, Brazil, after crossing the South Atlantic from South Africa. We arrived just before sunset and finished after dark, probably like 10 p.m. I had been at sea for weeks and was dying to get off the ship. I had two hours to kill until I stood the midnight to 4 a.m. watch. So me and another guy leave the ship in search of a place to get a beer or some new food, as opposed to the galley fare the cook had been making for days on end. Anyone who's seen the world from a ship can tell you that you don't go to new ports. You go to the same port over and over. A run-down waterfront industrial park surrounded by shitty industrial-adjacent neighborhoods. We walk out the main gate and hit a residential neighborhood that I can best describe as a barrio as an ignorant first worlder. House after house in a random labyrinth of narrow alleys. It's a ghost town. No one is on the streets walking the whole time in a long shadow cast by the infrequent yellow floodlights randomly attached to buildings or telephone poles. All the windows are barred. Atop all the walls surrounding these homes, there are shards of shattered glass embedded in the mortar, a not uncommon security thing around the less developed word. And then we turn the corner, and there's this tiny clearing bathed in bright fluorescent light. There's a little takeout window and a random assortment of benches and plastic lawn chairs. It's about 11, but it's lit up, so we knock on the window. We're about to leave when that guy shows up rubbing the sleep from his eyes. We feel like shit for waking this guy up, but he's super excited to see rich white people at his food stand. We weren't rich, but people in developing countries equate white first-worlders with extravagant spending. Since we hadn't seen a money changer at this hour, we paid in United States dollars and totally feel the stereotype. It took him like 15 minutes to open his kitchen and I guess ignite stoves. We're running out of time and have a long walk back, but he insists we stay and eat. Oh, and Portuguese is the language in Brazil, and unlike a cafe in Paris, this guy doesn't speak English, like at all. So this whole thing is pantomimed with gestures. We want food. He points at the make line in his kitchen, wanting to know what we want. I point at the bread, meat, and make sweeping give me the works motions over all of it. Time passes. He gives us these little plastic thin office trash bag type plastic bags like the size of your fist. Sticking halfway out is a small sandwich roll. Looks like lettuce, veggies, meat, the usual. But it's got this creamy cheese sauce with a consistency somewhere between melted cheese and mayonnaise. I think it's queso. It's delicious as F, and we order two more. The sandwich comes in a plastic bag to contain the sauce, like cheese that it's floating in. Never seen anything like it before or since.
We pay the man with two twenty dollars S's, and he gives us a few Brazilian reels back, so now we got some local cash. We walk back through the empty streets, finishing our food, trying to clean our fingers and faces of this sauce too viscous and sticky for napkins to ever clean. We finish at a steady jog to make it through the gate in time for the midnight watch. Anyway, in this shadowy ghost town, it was kind of mysterious to stumble upon this light. And the darkness window that sold bag sandwiches containing magical liquid cheese. So I often go up to Alaska to visit my grandparents and go fly fishing. It has to be my favorite hobby besides music. Anyways, this one summer, when I was about 14, I had an interesting experience. Well, me and my grandfather are hiking down this trail to our favorite fishing spot. It's about an eight-hour walk. We carry in tents, food, and fishing gear. Anyways, when we are about halfway through the walk, we find that in the middle of the trail is what looks like in a giant A. Two trees were broken at the stump on either side of the trail and leaned against each other at the tips. These were these medium-sized bushy pine trees you see all over the mountainside. So we think nothing of it and pass under it and keep walking until we finally get to our campsite. When we get there, we find more trees broken like the one before. Not just haphazardly, but literally the exact same way. Both me and my grandfather are confused as hell about this, but whatever, it's probably some dumb asses that found this place and wanted to scare people. Oh, well, people were here messing around. Let's get set up. So we do and settle in for the night. I'm in my single-person tent, and my grandfather is in his a few feet away. I fall asleep pretty quick. Sometime later that night, my grandfather starts shaking me by the shoulder and telling me to wake up. I crawl out of the tent to look around. It was that time of year that night is just perpetual twilight, so we could still see pretty well. All of a sudden, I hear this high-pitched scream. Like if you ever heard a lynx scream, it would have been pretty much dead on, but it had some weird twinge to it. We both wrote it off as such, but I still thought something was off about it as we sat there listening to it. The next morning we got up and started fishing. It was going great. Both me and my grandfather had caught a lot of grayling. We had moved down to where our backs were to this berm that was covered in brush. At the top were these good-sized rocks. After about 30 minutes there, we hear this loud racket coming from camp like someone was throwing shit around. That same lynx scream was coming from the direction of our camp. And as soon as that one scream went up, a second one started from behind the berm. We both flip around and start looking at the berm while glancing back to camp. We start seeing something moving just over the other side. This weird-looking head kept popping up and down. It was a dark gray head shaped like Patrick's stars. We only saw what we thought was the forehead and up. Before we could make it out, this boulder, no joke, bigger than me at the time, comes flying over and lands right in front of me and my grandfather. Of course, we boat back to camp. When we get there, we find that all of our gear is trashed. The tent had shreds in it. Our coolers were thrown everywhere and our packs torn open. We heard the dam scream again and started running. We ran and ran and ran until I puked. All the while, we would hear whoops and the screams from far off behind us. When we made it back to that a shape thing, the trees were snapped in half and thrown to the side. We finally made it back to my grandfather's truck and drove the F out of there. Never going back there again. I don't want to know what it was, and frankly, I don't care. I'm just glad I got out of there. I used to live in a log cabin in the middle of nowhere in Missouri when I was younger. My cousin's living right across the field from us, and grandparents living right down the road. Anyway, as kids would go out playing in the woods, usually we stayed pretty close to the house, but one day we wandered pretty far into the woods just to see what we can find. We end up coming out of the woods in this open field on this hill that overlooks a huge field of crops. In the middle of hill is a super worn down green cabin, decent size, probably barn size. Being kids, of course, we go to check it out. Inside are books, 
really, really old books, and not like books on shelves like some secret library. No, a huge mound of books like flowing out of the house. You couldn't even see the floor of the cabin. Just humongous pile of books took up every room, every cabinet, and in the first big room, I guess what was a living room area. My cousin could almost touch the ceiling when he was standing at the top of the pile. Drove past it about two years ago. There's a back road by the farmer's field that looks up at the hill. The cabin's torn down now with orange tape wrapped around it. One of the oddest things I've ever experienced in my life. I live in Delhi, India, and love the Himalayas for its beautiful snow peaks and never miss a chance to go there whether solo or with group. I always avoided the popular tourist places. I'd my fair share of strange, creepy experiences, but this one beats them all. However, I was not alone, but with a friend, and it happened around ten years back. We spent a night at Chimoli, then we take small road from it, instead of sticking to our plan and decided to explore that area and went quite far that there were no cell phone signals and no villages nearby. After 3 p.m. we fortunately saw a local cowboy and asked him for a hotel nearby. He told us that there is one hotel on a nearby road. After one hour we reached that hotel. The hotel owner was surprised to see us, said that he normally gets very few visitors. We were pretty tired and went to sleep after dinner. During sleep, I had this weird dream. I remember it very vaguely now. I saw three beautiful women, probably in thirties, all in traditional dress and jewelry, kind of centuries old, never seen before. I could not understand their language. It was not Hindi. It was like we all four are sitting, and they are talking to each other and to me probably trying to explain something to me, but I just could not understand what they are saying. I woke up in morning and talked to my friend about this. He also had the same dream, and it was the same three ladies. Imagine our reaction. We were shocked, horrified, and wanted to get out of there ASAP. We went to hotel owner. He looked at our face and started laughing. He then said, looks like you dreamed last night, and we must have seen the three ladies in dream." This really freaked us out. However, he told us a story about dreams. This dream happens to all the new travelers and only happened first time and not again. He said he also had the same dream when he bought that hotel and stayed there for first time. He also said he wanted to experience that dream again and again as three women are really beautiful. And nearby villagers also told about this dream to hotel owner. The local legend is that those three women were queens of a local king long time back. The king had a war with invading Islamic army, and when news of king being martyred arrived, they all decided to become Sadie before the invading king arrived. They all died on that mountain. Before that, I was totally a science guy and never believed in things like that, but after experiencing it firsthand, I now believe in things like this. My co-driver and I generally took contracts from Utah to Pennsylvania, and we would make those deliveries in less than 48 hours. It was always finding contracts back that was a little trickier, but eventually we'd find two or three contracts that would lead us back to Utah. I wasn't comfortable with driving at night, but my co-driver loved it, so he drove during the night and I drove during the day. This would change once winter hit because the days were a lot shorter. I would start my shift sometime around 5-7 a.m. so that my co-driver could start his shift around 6-8 p.m. One time we had to make a delivery with a very tight deadline. And to make it as efficient as possible, that meant I would have to drive several hours after sunset. Since we were out in the boonies, it was pitch black on the highway with the occasional speeding car or truck that the darkness would engulf within a mile. I would have been more at ease if there was a fella truck on the road with me because it would have increased my line of sight. But this wasn't the case. I was the only one on the road at that time, and I could only see as far as my headlights. Then, before I knew it, I saw someone standing at the side of the road. 
I thought he was a hitchhiker, but the person wasn't looking at me. When I got closer, the person jumped in front of the truck. I screamed and shifted down so quick. The commotion made my co-driver jump out of the cab, and I explained what happened while parking the truck on the shoulder. We checked the front of the truck, but there was no sign that I hit anything. I was too chicken to go look for that person, so my co-driver went to check, but he found no one. We, wife and I, take expeditions to backcountry Vermont, fly fishing in the spring, and usually do really well on brookies. We hike downstream, camp and fish back. We generally will put on 10, 15 miles on a long weekend. Anyway, so this spring we were doing our usual hitting nice pools and catching natives. One afternoon we were hiking back to camp on the bank. We came over a rise, and about forty yards away was a barefoot man, gray breeches, long untucked white shirt, standing on the river edge below us. I froze. He was staring straight ahead across the river, and then his head jerked at our direction. The whole person was a strange color, like a foggy scene almost. I was fixed on him, maybe four or six seconds, and looked back at my wife. The look on her face told me she had already seen it, too. I looked right back, and the person was gone. No way a living human could have fled without us seeing. We chatted bewildered for a few, and then I had to go to check for tracks. No, nope, not any sign. Yeah, that was interesting. I used to ride share with a colleague on a 45-minute trip to and from work each day. While sitting as passenger one day, gazing out the window, I very clearly saw a dead body hanging from a tree in a field close to the motorway. My stomach turned immediately, and I said, Oh, shit, did you see that? My colleague asked what happened. I told him I'd just see someone hanging from a tree in the field back there. For the rest of the day, I was pretty shook up by it. My colleague was somewhat skeptical and suggested that we look again tomorrow on the way home, only that I would drive instead, the idea being that he could see for himself. Anyway, on the journey home, I drove in the slow lane and we approached the same spot. I slowed down as much as I could, bearing in mind this is a 70 miles per hour motorway, and sure enough, the body was still hanging from the tree. My body shot cold again not close enough to see features, but enough to make out from the clothes that it was most likely a man. However, my colleague still could not see where I was pointing, and he missed it again. I went home and googled local news, etc. for any missing person and came up with nothing. I decided the next day that I would have to take action and stop on the hard shoulder or lay by and report this. The next day comes, and on the drive back, we stop on the hard shoulder of the motorway. Get out and make our way to the tree. I remember my mouth being dry and my heart racing as we approached. We came to the clearing from which you could see the tree. All that was hanging from the tree was a snapped rope. It was a beautiful day during archery season and I decided to venture out on my usual morning hunt. The sun felt so warm and inviting that I couldn't resist the urge to take a nap before embarking on my late afternoon hunt back to camp. I found a perfect spot under a tree overlooking a dry creek bed with a large patch of young pine trees about seven to ten feet tall at the top of the clearing. The area then opened up into a 50 by 75 yard clearing, surrounded by mostly separated timber. The small pine tree location was fairly dense. I remember being jolted awake by loud thumping noises like heavy objects hitting solid dirt in tree branches snapping. I instantly thought, here come the elk. So I pulled myself together and eagerly prepared to see some elk emerging from the small pine trees. Instead, what I saw next left me baffled and uneasy. Large rocks weighing 50 to 100 pounds were being hurled through the air. They seemed to be coming from within the pine tree patch, and the commotion lasted for what felt like an eternity. But in reality, it was only about one to two minutes. I was completely taken aback. 
I had seen over thirty bears in the wild, had close encounters, and even observed them with spotting scopes. But what I was witnessing now was utterly unexplainable. I was certain that this was not a bear. Bears row rocks, but they don't throw fifty to one hundred pound rocks. After the situation settled down, I cautiously walked back to camp and anxiously waited for my dad to return. The next day I took my dad to the spot where I had experienced the strange event. We examined the rocks and found the exact spots where they had been removed from the ground. We could even see where the rocks had hit the ground and bounced. Unfortunately, we couldn't find any tracks since the ground was really hard and there was a lot of grass undergrowth. My dad and I were left with more questions than answers, but one thing was for sure. Something extraordinary and inexplicable had happened that day in the dense pine tree patch. This happened about eight years ago when I was eleven. I was over at my best friend's house for a sleepover. We, my best friend, his older brother, and I were all sitting around wondering what to do when older brother suggests we go to the park at which we happily agree. Now something to know, this park wasn't actually a park at all. It was actually a small and dense patch of forest in the middle of the suburb where my best friend lived. So we all get ready and make the five-minute walk down there. We are there for about half an hour when we decide to stop and take a break in the middle of the forest. As we were sitting there, we thought it would be fun to do the whistle from the Hunger Games. The movie had just come out, and we were all obsessed with it at the time. So we all started doing it until the brother told us to be quiet. At first we didn't know when, but then we heard it, a faint whistle back. The brother did it again and again. There was a reply only this time. It was closer, and it kept getting closer. We all froze, not sure of what to do until it seemed to stop. We all agreed that it was time to go home at this point, and as we were about to come out of where we hid, I heard from a bush behind me, Hey, come here. And you can bet we took off running, as we were running. I swear I could hear someone running after us, so I turned my head back to look, and when I turned back, I ran eye first into a tree branch. I took a nasty fall, hitting my head. I don't really remember what happened after, but my friend and his brother must have carried me out, because the next thing I remember was my best friend over me asking if I was okay, and we were in the field on the opposite end of where we entered. I had a black eye from the stick and a mild concussion from the full. The boys were both covered in cuts and bruises from running through the woods. We have never been back there since. We're all adults now, my best friend 18. His brother 20 and I 19, and we still talk about it and speculate on who or what that could have been. My friend and I were excited to go hunting on Gowdyville Road, just over the top of Gowdyville Mountain. The area was known for its abundance of game, and we were eager to test our skills and enjoy a day outdoors. As we trekked deeper into the woods, the sound of leaves crunching beneath our feet filled the air. I was following closely behind my friend, keeping an eye out for any signs of movement in the trees. Suddenly, my friend stopped so abruptly that I accidentally hit him in the back with my rifle. Startled, I asked him what was wrong. Look at this, he whispered, pointing to the ground. In the soft mud, we found several large tracks, each measuring about 16 inches long. They were unlike anything we had ever seen before. The tracks appeared to have been made by a large bipedal creature, leaving us both feeling a mix of excitement and fear. We cautiously followed the tracks, trying to determine where they might lead. As we continued along the path, we couldn't help but discuss the possibility that these tracks belonged to the legendary Bigfoot. We knew that the area was home to many stories of sightings and encounters, but neither of us had ever expected to find such compelling evidence ourselves. After tracking the mysterious prints for what felt like hours, we eventually lost the trail. The tracks seemed to vanish as suddenly as they had appeared, leaving us with more questions than answers. We returned to our campsite still buzzing with adrenaline from our discovery. 
That night, as we sat around the campfire, we couldn't stop talking about the tracks we had found earlier. We debated whether we should report our find or keep it to ourselves, fearing that others might not believe our story. In the end, we decided to share our experience with a few trusted friends and family members, hoping that our discovery would add to the growing body of evidence surrounding the existence of Bigfoot. Though we never found any further proof of the creature during our hunting trips, the memory of that day on Gaudyville Mountain would stay with us forever, serving as a constant reminder of the mysteries that still lie hidden in the wilderness. A few years ago, my sister decided to have a surprise 30th birthday for her husband. Since he missed his senior prom, she decided to make it the theme of the party and even booked the same hall his prom was hosted in when he was a teenager. Problem is, my brother-in-law grew up in basically the middle of nowhere, a small rural Missouri town that you have to leave the highway and travel down about five miles of heavily wooded back roads to get to. On top of being so isolated, there's a rather large heroin problem out there both using and dealing. It's a pretty potent cocktail, but my sister was determined to have the party there. The party was at six, and my original plan was to drive out with my sister and her friends to help set up. My sister was heavily pregnant at the time and needed all the help she could get, and then drive back home with her. However, I got called into work and had to stay until four, so I told my sister I would drive up by myself as soon as I was done. She warned me that it was pretty easy to get turned around on those country roads, but I had Google Maps to help me and didn't worry about it. The drive up was fine. It was late September, my favorite time of year, and the scenery was surprisingly pretty. I found the place, no problem, and helped with some last-minute set-up before my brother-in-law showed up. The party was a lot of fun and lasted until about 11. When the hall closed, I was one of the last people to leave, having stayed behind to help my sister and her friend stack chairs. Brother-in-law had overindulged at the open bar and had to be driven home by his friend. We ended up not actually heading out until almost midnight, and by that point I was exhausted. My sister once again warned me about being careful on the back roads, but I'd gotten up there okay, so I wasn't too concerned about the drive home. I hugged her goodbye, hopped into my car, and started working my way back to the highway. Unfortunately, in my sleepy state, I misjudged which road I was supposed to turn off as I reached the exit for the highway and ended up turning down an entirely different road that ran parallel to it instead. It was another heavily wooded and narrow back road. I started looking for somewhere I could pull in to turn around. After driving maybe 200 yards, I spotted a gravel embankment and decided to pull in there so I could get turned around. I pulled in and made a sharp U-turn so I could head back up the road, and as I lifted my head to check no one was coming, I saw it in my driver's side mirror, a figure in a dark blue tetcher and jeans with long black hair and a pale face, illuminated in my brake lights. My heart jumped into my throat as I gasped in fright. But after a second of pure panic, I realized that the pale face was actually a mask, one of those cheap plastic white ones you get at costume stores. I immediately felt like an idiot. It was almost October, so obviously this was a Halloween decoration. This embankment probably led to someone's driveway, and the family who lived there probably had tons of things just like it in their yard. I took a moment to unclench my hands from the steering wheel and let my heart rate get back to normal and ended up catching a glimpse of the thing in my mirror again. And I noticed that the embankment didn't lead to a driveway. There was nothing else behind me but tall grass and trees. I briefly wondered why anyone would put a Halloween decoration out in the middle of nowhere. And then the decoration took a step forward. I slammed on the gas and shot forward eventually getting back to the main road and onto the highway. I don't think I stopped shaking until I reached my town city limits half an hour later. Looking back, I definitely wasn't in any danger. I was in a car 
All the doors were locked, and I could easily have run down whoever that creep was if they tried anything. If they'd gotten even one step closer when panic mode set in, that's probably what I would have done. It was probably just a kid or a local druggie in a crappy mask, giving motorists a good scare and not really thinking about the consequences. But still, it was definitely one of the creepiest moments of my life, and I'm still nervous driving down secluded country roads at night these days. I had always been drawn to stories that defied explanation, but little did I know that my journalistic curiosity would lead me into a world of intrigue and mystery. As a newsman in West Virginia, I found myself venturing into Braxton County, where an unusual incident had unfolded. News had spread of an airplane crash in the area, piquing my interest. I made my way to the site, hoping to uncover the truth behind the peculiar event. As I arrived, a sense of tension hung in the air, and I could see a small crowd gathered around the wreckage. Approaching the scene, I noticed a man standing nearby, clad in a suit that seemed out of place for the rural surroundings. His appearance caught my attention. High cheekbones, slant eyes, and dark skin that hinted at a foreign origin. Intrigued, I approached him, hoping he could shed some light on the situation. With a calm demeanor, he assured me that no one had been hurt in the crash, and that no crime had been committed. His words perplexed me. How could such an incident occur without any consequences or investigation? Something didn't add up. Curiosity getting the better of me, I noticed a small metallic object lying on the ground near the wreckage. It seemed insignificant, almost like a trinket or a toy. Without thinking much of it, I picked it up and slipped it into my pocket, Perhaps it could serve as a clue in unraveling the truth. As night fell and the world around me grew quiet, I found myself restless at home. The events of the day lingered in my mind, the unanswered questions gnawing at my insatiable curiosity. It was around 3 a.m. when a sudden knock on my door shattered the silence, jolting me from my thoughts. Opening the door cautiously, I was taken aback to find an army officer standing before me. His appearance mirrored that of the man at the crash site, the same high cheekbones, slant eyes, and dark skin. It was as if they were cut from the same cloth. Without hesitation, the officer demanded the return of the metal thingamajig I'd picked up earlier. Surprised and caught off guard, I reluctantly handed it over to him, my mind racing with questions. How did he know I had taken it? And why was it of such importance? The army officer thanked me sternly his expression revealing nothing. With the object back in his possession, he turned and left, disappearing into the night, as mysteriously as he had appeared. Left standing in my doorway, I couldn't help but wonder what secrets this strange artifact held. I still remember the day I first set foot on the grounds of West Point, the prestigious United States Military Academy. The campus, with its gothic castle-like buildings, exuded an air of both grandeur and eeriness. As an aspiring army officer, I was ready to embark on a journey that would test my limits physically, mentally, and spiritually. Being a cadet at West Point meant living in the barracks, which were more like ancient structures that seemed to have stood the test of time. Assigned to the infamous Lost Fifties barracks during my sophomore year, I found myself in the midst of stories and legends of ghostly encounters. It was said that the spirits of fallen soldiers roamed the halls, their presence felt by those who dared to stay up late, studying or succumb to sleep deprivation. As an engineering student, my days were filled with demanding classes and rigorous training. Sleep became a luxury I could rarely afford, and the constant exhaustion blurred the line between reality and imagination. The creaking floors, the mysterious noises, and the occasional slamming of doors all became part of the background noise in my sleep-deprived existence. I shrugged it off, convinced that even the ghosts would have to wait their turn if they wanted to haunt me. 
Fast forward to 2011, and I found myself deployed to the unforgiving terrain of Afghanistan. It was a harsh reality, a far cry from the hallowed halls of West Point. My best friend and college roommate, who shared the same dreams of serving our country, was tragically taken from us in an ambush. Grief consumed me, and my mind couldn't help but wander into the realm of the supernatural. The day after his death, I had a dream. A vivid encounter that felt both surreal and hauntingly real. In that dream, my friend and I had a conversation, as if he were standing right beside me. His words echoed with an otherworldly wisdom as he warned me of the dangers that lay ahead. Watch out for Ides, he said. When the road turns to loose dirt, you need to be vigilant. I woke up shaken to the core. Was it just a dream born out of grief and guilt? Or was there something more to it? Despite my skepticism, I couldn't ignore the lingering feeling that his message held significance. With a heavy heart and a newfound sense of caution, I prepared for another routine convoy security mission. As we traversed the dusty Afghan roads, I couldn't shake off the image of loose dirt under our wheel. And then it happened, a deafening explosion, shattering the calm of the surrounding desert. Our vehicle had struck an iad, and chaos erupted. Amid the chaos and the smoke, I found myself relatively unharmed, save for a few stitches and a renewed sense of awe. The dream, my friend's warning, had come true. It was as if he had guided me through the darkness, protecting me from the very dangers that took his life. In the aftermath of that fateful day, I couldn't help but reflect on the mysteries of life and death and the thin veil that separates them. The lost fifties barracks with its alleged hauntings seemed to hold a deeper meaning now. Perhaps the spirits of those who had gone before us were not mere tales or figments of imagination, but guardians watching over us in ways we could never fully comprehend. My army career continued forever marked by the memory of my fallen friend and the unexplained events that unfolded. Life taught me that there are forces beyond our understanding, and sometimes the supernatural intertwines with our reality in ways we can only begin to fathom. And so I walked on, with a newfound respect for the mysteries that lie beneath the surface, ever vigilant and ready to face whatever may come. My husband worked as a government contractor for a company that sends him all over the world. For a few years, my daughter and I would travel with him. He was usually gone for months at a time. One of his business trips was to Bremerton, Washington. We were put into an apartment called Olympic Village Apartments. It was rented out to companies like his. They were okay, fully furnished, better than a hotel, especially for that length of time that we usually saved. The apartment we had was on the ground floor. It was decorated well, and the furniture wasn't too worn. Nothing seemed or felt weird. I usually can read vibes of places where I go. I am not sure how to explain it. I don't think I am psychic, just maybe. In tune with my surroundings, things seemed pretty normal for the first few days. I spent most days there since I didn't have a car, just playing my video games or watching TV. One night, my husband came home to the apartment, and I had dinner ready and set out. We all sat down at the table to eat, having the normal conversations people do, like how was work type stuff, when all of a sudden I felt something touch my thigh. I didn't respond to it because I wasn't sure exactly what had just happened, so I continued eating. A few moments later, it happened again. It felt familiar, like my old ten pounds. Chihuahua was begging for food. I looked down, thinking I would see a dog looking up at me, but there wasn't anything there. My instinct had been to move him down with my hand to get him to stop begging. I laughed out loud and said to my husband, I keep feeling like there's a dog here. I felt something jump at my leg and I almost pushed it down. My husband said, that's weird because I feel like there is one here too. He told me he was on his way to the bathroom around 3 a.m. As soon as he walked out and turned to walk down the hall, he seen a small shadow sitting there still looking at him. 
He jumped back, startled, and it disappeared. I was in shock because I didn't expect anyone to feel the same thing. It seemed weird. I am very connected to animals. I've always been my whole life. Dogs and I seem to have a very deep bond, almost on a spiritual level. About a week later, it was a weekend, and my husband and I were watching TV. We were both on our own couch. Mine was the large sofa, so I was stretched out under a blanket, almost without any thinking. I went to readjust my position, and the moment I thought my dog was laying in the crease of the back of my knee, where my legs bend. I was being careful to not squash him or move him because I felt a weight on the blanket. I looked, and nothing was there. I felt weird. I told my husband what had happened. Everything was normal for a while after that. I hadn't felt the dog since the couch. One night I woke up and had to go to the bathroom. I am night blind and I wear glasses, but I decided to just go without putting them on. The bathroom had a window and a light from outside shined through with just enough light that I could see once I got close and around the corner. So I headed down the hall, sliding my hand slowly across the wall so I could feel where to go. I was looking straight ahead. But it was pitch black. I came to the corner with my hand still tracing the side, and I saw something. It was darker than the dark hall, but the darkness blocked the light from the window. The light traced a body. Its height brought my head to look instinctively up towards where a face would be. I froze in terror, gasped, and jumped back, scared because I thought it was a real person. Where the head would be, it looked like he was wearing a top hat. This dark figure seemed to be close to six feet five tall. Once I realized it wasn't human, I quickly rushed past it to turn on the bathroom light. With the light on, I seen that nothing was there. Years later, I brought this up to my daughter. I didn't want to tell her before, because she was still little, and she shared with me she also seen a man there who would stand in the corner, with a big hat and a little dog at his feet. This happened only three weeks ago. I've thought about it often, and I know without a doubt, me and my patient were almost prey to a predator. I work for my state. I work with people with substance abuse disorder, the mentally ill, and to a lesser degree, those with slight developmental delays. My role with the developmentally delayed is similar to a lower-ranked social worker. One thing I have to verify is that the participant is able to achieve their own personal goals set for that year, similar to an IEP in public schools. One of my patients has a goal to walk and or hike at least one mile three times a week. When I made my visit to her home, walking hiking was what I need to see her achieve. So she took us both on a walking slight hiking trail nearby. Her and I are actually similar age. Our forties. As we were walking the trail, we got to a point that was much more isolated. We were no longer walking the trail that loops around the neighborhood pond with many people, but we were on trail that took us through the woods in a cotton field. Her and I were walking and talking when she suddenly stopped walking. I looked at her, and just as she went to say, "I have a bad feeling. I had an overwhelming feeling myself that someone was watching us." Due to her development delays. I felt more concerned for her welfare than my own. It's hard to explain, but I didn't feel fear. I felt a feeling of protecting her. I looked behind us because I heard the sound of leaves crunching, and sure enough, a guy who looked to be in his thirties was suddenly coming out of the woods, and he's slowly creeping up towards us. There was no one else around, so for this guy to magically come out of the woods and creeping up, I knew whatever he wanted was nefarious. I told her to continue walking. Giving her a head start. I don't know why I even did this, but I just completely turned myself around, stopped, and I looked straight at him. I just stared. I didn't say anything. He didn't say anything, but as soon as we locked eyes, it was as if he realized now they know I'm back here because he froze and stopped walking towards us. I kept staring at him. Then I started to walk back towards my patient, so he understood my eyes were on him. Then, as I walked backwards, I looked over to see my patient, looked back at him, and he disappeared as fast as he came, back into the woods. If he were just wanting to walk this nature trail, 
Why did he stop as soon I turned around and stared? Why wouldn't he just continue on his walk and pass us? This guy was clearly waiting and watching for a woman, or women, to go down the isolated trail. For him to come out of the woods when he did, it was clear to me that he was out hiding and stalking. I will forever be convinced that my patient's bad feeling and my feeling of being watched saved one or both of us from whatever that man had planned. I'm a pretty avid backpacker in the Pacific Northwest. Sometimes I'll hike for days on end without seeing another person. I think it's exhilarating being completely alone. There's really no feeling like it. You get used to it, but personally I can never help but be on edge. The environment is completely serene and friendly, but there's a constant feeling in the back of your mind. It's hard to put your finger on. Most of the time, you'll be chugging along, comfortable in your mind, but when you stop for rest or to fill up on water, you can't help but look over your shoulder. Nothing bothers me much out in the woods. I've run into brown bears, had elk trample through camps late at night, and much more. But one night was different. I was on a deep backwoods hike in the late fall off. Season was pretty cold, but the snow hadn't quite started falling yet. I like that. In fact, I usually plan my trips this way. The forest ranger I talked to when I was organizing the trip said I was the only hiker she knew of who'd be up there at the time. I was using dispersed camping sites so far off the beaten path they don't have fire pits. That night was five or six miles from the trail into the area. I set up camp at a site about a hundred yards from a, a stream close enough that a faint babbling was audible. I'd lit a fire, cooked dinner, read for a while, and was settling down to sleep. I lay listening for a while to the sounds of the woods and the creek. Just as I was nodding off, I think I hear voices. Nothing distinct, no clear words, but clearly a group of people was having a good time. Laughing, maybe telling stories around a campfire. A feeling of dread came over me. I thought, I shouldn't leave the tent. Fear like I've never felt engulfed me. All the hairs on my arms, legs, and on the back of my neck stood on end. I lay there for a while in panic, the voices carrying on laughing indistinctly. After a while, they receded into the background noise. I still didn't leave the tent. I was too afraid. The next morning, after a very short night's sleep, I searched the surrounding area and the path to the site. The few shoe prints I found were faded and worn around the edges too old and too few to be from the size of group I'd heard. I tried to shrug it off as nerves, maybe nervousness got the best of me, but I couldn't shake a certain tension. I made good time to my next sight, the last of the trip, looking around a little more than usual. Still nobody to be seen. That sight had no stream. Dry camping isn't a blast, but it's doable if you pack enough water for cooking and drinking for the night. It was a lot quieter, just the chirps of bugs and the wind rustling the trees. I cooked my dinner and stayed up a good while after dark sitting on a log, looking at the stars and listening to the sounds of the forest, trying to hear the voices from the night before. But there was nothing. I turned in for the night, stretching every act out. I lay there, restless for what felt like hours. Finally, calm comes over me. In the ayat's back, Nothing threatening or particularly scary, just the sounds of a group of fifteen, twenty having a good time, barely audible above the background noise. This time I'm calm, and there's what seems like an internal dialogue in the back of my mind. Why not join them? Sounds like they're having fun. I'd really rather stay here. This is entirely unconscious and goes on for a while. I'd never experienced anything like this. I was worried that I'd lost it. After a time, the noises faded away into the white noise, and I felt that I was alone. The next day, I packed as quickly as I could and got out of Dodge. During the day, I was more at ease like I had always been in the past. I was relieved when I got to the car and started back home. I told the story a few times, and every time I felt a little of that dread from the first night, I really had no reason to feel strongly about what had happened. I just heard strange noises in the forest. Nothing extraordinary, but I felt it. 
On one occasion, I told the story my teacher, who's native. He got quiet for a minute, then said I had run into stick Indians. He said that it was good that I didn't leave the tent. Stick Indians are evil and dangerous beings that prey on children and women. The look on his face was sober. He told me not to go back to that place again. These spirits are extremely aggressive and attack and kill at the slightest provocation, including even saying their silish name, which he refused to do. Whenever the subject comes up, I get that same fear in me. As I write this, I'm thousands of miles from those sites, and my arms are still quaking. This began a few years ago when I took up regular walking for my health. Not many people in my city walk, so usually I am the only one walking for miles all around. Yet I would regularly cross paths with someone else walking in a different direction at intersections. For example, with me walking east or west and them walking north or south. No one else around, and yet sometimes we would both have to slightly change our direction or pace to avoid bumping into each other. Other times it would happen so we would pass within a few feet of each other. The first few times this happened it was quite unnerving. It seemed so bizarre. I would cross the road and look around. Not another soul in sight except people in cars. But there was nothing creepy about it. They were all just normal people, strangers doing their own thing, perhaps on their way to work or shopping, some just taking their dog for a stroll. Sometimes it would be a couple of friends. I wouldn't notice them again either. It would always be someone different next time. Yet this coincidental crossing of paths just kept happening several times a week, sometimes as frequently as twice in a single day. It puzzled me since it seemed the chances of two crossing paths on an otherwise deserted city grid was fairly low. It wasn't just walking along the sidewalks either. It could happen in relatively deserted park. It became something I expected now. For example, I would be walking on a diagonal path across a sports field. I would look around, and sure enough, there would often be someone far off in the distance, walking on a perfect course to intercept me at nearly right angle to my courses. Oh, right, there they are, I would say to myself. I just began to accept it as this weird thing that kept happening for no particular reason. Any insights or ideas into why this happens? The only person I've ever told is my wife at the time, now my ex. She laughed and accused me of making it all up. Before I get to my encounter, I'll give you a little backstory. I was born in Mobile, Alabama in 1964. Up until the mid-twenties, I'd never been on any higher ground than a couple of hundred feet above sea level. In the mid-eighties to early nineties, my sister had gotten married and moved to Rowan Mountain in eastern Tennessee. My wife and I took a trip up there to visit for a week. After the first few days of running around and seeing the sights, we spent the day just hanging out at the house. This led to a few cold beverages being consumed and the grill getting fired up that evening. Later that night, around 9 p.m., I went out on the back porch to get another beer. That's when I noticed about half a dozen deer about 100 yards out in the field behind the house. One had a nice rack, and I couldn't quite make out the number of points, so I slipped off the porch and eased over to the corner of the fence, which put me about 60 to 70 yards away from them. As I'm standing there against the fence watching the deer, the big one was a nice 10-point minimum 200 class. That's when I noticed the moon. When I say it noticed, I mean noticed, it was huge and seemed so much closer than I'd ever seen it before. Now I've been out in the Gulf of Mexico at night and been able to witness the moon well away from any city lights, and you can see all kinds of detail on the surface of the moon with the naked eye. But that night I finally understood what the word awesome means or what awestruck means. So I'm standing at this fence watching the deer, or was supposed to be, but I can't take my eyes off this big glowing yellowish, orange ball of light that seems to be just out of reach. 
So after what I thought was around 20 minutes later, uh, I found out it was more like an hour. I start noticing a tickling sensation on the back of my neck. I shrugged my shoulders and turned my neck a couple of times, trying to shake loose whatever it was it was tickling me, and just then the deer got spooked and bounced away. The noise finally forced me to break my gaze on the moon. That's when I realized that I've probably been out there long enough. I decided to go back inside. I took one last look and mumbled at, Wow, wow at the beauty of this little sun. Reflecting satellite that orbits our world, and that's when it hit me. I felt the hot breath of a huge creature hit the back of my neck at the same time hearing or feeling the deepest chest rumbling. Um, I've ever heard. I spied onto my right, looking over my shoulder. All I could see was black as far as my peripheral vision would allow. It was all Bigfoot. This all happened in a split second. When I got my head around far enough, I realized that my face was maybe eight to ten inches away from this thing's upper abdomen. Looking up, I saw this beast's pectoral muscles stuck off his chest about six inches and were huge. His chest was every bit of four and a half feet wide, his shoulders. They're as big as basketballs, added another foot or so on each side from shoulder to shoulder. This thing was at least six feet wide. I've not got a good look at his hands or face, but his arms were probably more impressive than his chest and shoulders. If Hulk Hogan has 22-inch pipe bones, this bipedal beast was sporting 20. Eight to 30-inch guns. His forearms would make Poppy jealous. His arms were covered in long, dark hair, maybe four or six inches in length. If I had to guess, this behemoth must have been around ten feet tall and seven to eight hundred pounds. As far as his face goes, from the angle I was at all, it could make out was a squared-off bearded chin. I cannot see a nose, eyes, ears, raised brow ridge, conical head, nothing, so I can't say whether it looked more like a man or an ape. His arms were more like an ape's, but his chest was more human, like just a little more hairy than most. Now, this is where the story starts getting weird. As I mentioned earlier, it all happened in a split second. As I spun around and was in the process of looking up, this thing was going from a bent-over position to standing up straight and taking a step back to his right. As he pulled his left leg over his right, it was like he was slipping through a slit in a green screen. I'm not sure if it was a portal or some sort of interdimensional doorway or what. All I know is this huge thing vanished within that split second. By the way, there was no foul smell associated with this creature. There was a slight musty smell, but it reminded me of the same smell a horse gives off. I mean, you could smell it, but I'm not going to say it was a stench. I will say this, I hear a lot of people saying that these things are evil and demons, and they may be. All I know is I got the impression that this beast was intelligent and appreciated my interest in the moon. The arm that he gave out made me feel the same way I would feel when I do something good that would make my grandfather proud, and he would give me the same approving hum that this Bigfoot did. You just never had the same volume or power that this thing did. Thanks for listening. Hope to see you tomorrow, son.